I call to order the regular session of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs on Tuesday, October 3rd, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. Roll call, please. Mayor Vatikiotis? Here. Vice Mayor Lunt? Here. Commissioner Eisner? Here. Commissioner Kouyas? Here. Commissioner Koulianis? Here. Uh, this, e this evening's um, reflection is going to be given by Reverend Christina Spod of the Unitarian Universalist Church. If we remain standing, please turn to the flag so we can pledge of allegiance. Spirit of life and love, spirit of justice and mercy, known by many names, among them God. We are gathered this evening to do the work and to witness to the work of making a community, of running, of building, of stewarding a community. We give thanks for the work done by our commissioners, mayor, vice mayor, manager, and all the elected and appointed officials serving this community where we live and work and play. May you be grounded in values of both civics and faith, however you might define that, to include those who might be called the least, the lost, and the last, for all are our neighbors and siblings. May you be mindful to provide resources for those with few, if any, means, especially those who have been denied access to ensure care is available for all in need of it. To remember those too who cannot vote, the homeless, the children, the earth, the creatures, as they too are your constituents. May you be reminded to continue to ask questions from a place of curiosity. May you continue to be granted the wisdom and courage to support this community as it grows and changes. May you remember that you are held by and accountable to the community whose care you are entrusted with and who trusts you to act justly. Spirit of life and love, spirit of justice and mercy, I ask that you offer your presence to these leaders and servants tonight and always, that their minds may be stilled and their hearts opened to the work before them this and every day. This we pray in the name of all that is good and right and true. You can turn to the flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Vincent, if I could have you and your team come forward, please. This evening, we have a proclamation to one of our special departments here at the city of Tarpon Springs, the planning department. And this is Ms. Vincent's team. I'm gonna ask her to introduce everyone after the proclamation. Whereas planners work to improve the well-being of all people living in our communities by taking a comprehensive perspective consistent with the vision of the city's strategic plan, this approach leads to safer, resilient, more equitable, and more prosperous communities. And whereas we celebrate the role that planning plays in creating great communities each October with National Community Planning Month, and whereas community planning provides an opportunity for all residents to be meaningfully involved in helping decide on choices that determine the future of their community. And whereas the full benefits of planning requires public officials and citizens who understand, support, and demand excellence in planning and strategic plan implementation. And whereas American Planning Association endorses National Community Planning Month 
as an opportunity to, to highlight how planning is essential to recovery and how planners can lead communities to equitable, resilient, and long-lasting recovery. And whereas the city of Tarpon Springs recognizes the many valuable contributions made by our planning and zoning department as nothing less than essential to our success. And whereas the board of commissioners commends the work by our planning and zoning director, Renee Vincent and staff, Pat McNeese, Caroline Langford, Allie Keene, and Kim Creighton, we extend appreciation for the vital role our planning and zoning department manages in the daily operations of our city. Now, therefore, I, Coast of Atticotus, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, to hereby proclaim the month of October 2023 as Community Planning Month. Congratulations, Renee. Thank you, Mayor. Would you like to say a few words and introduce everyone? So uh, I just want to thank the continued support of the commission. Um, you guys are you know, you're great, you're involved, and you, you clearly care about what we do. I also do want to have a brief shout out to all of our appointed boards, because without them, none, none of this gets done. The Planning and Zoning Board, the Board of Adjustments, and the Historic Preservation Board. And I would also like to really recognize my awesome staff, because I couldn't get anything done without them. Pat McNeese is our planning supervisor. Caroline Lanford, principal planner, Allie Keene, principal planner, and Kim Creighton is our planning coordinator. So right. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to ask the commission if you'd like to make any comments uh, about this proclamation. Yeah, I, do. I do over here. So uh, I have a special place in my heart for you, for the planning and zoning board uh, commission uh, department. You know, have, having been a planning and zoning board member, uh, I got to work very closely with all these guys, and and it was a joy, and it's still a joy, more of a joy over there. But <laughs> it was it's a joy. You know, you you run an excellent department, and I have I can speak for myself that I have full faith in in you and your in your judgments. Thank you. Any other commissioner, Vice Mayor Lunt? Yeah, I just uh, want to say that I'm extremely proud of our planning department. They work extremely hard. They're very diligent and very concise in what they do. Um, and they keep improving, which is incredible because I thought excellence could never be improved on, but they seem to have done that. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I appreciate you all. I think you know that. We worked together on the Board of Adjustments for many years. Um, I'm glad to see that uh, we've taken some real good strides to um, organize, and I, I don't know if you could make it any better. I mean, it's, there's, there's a couple of tweaks here or there, but I, I appreciate all of your hard work. I see you all through town, and uh, I just appreciate all that you do. And I enjoyed working with you then, and I enjoy more now working with you. So thank you for what you do. Commissioner Kulias. Yes, uh, I just want to thank the planning department. I think you guys do a great job. It's it's been a so far a great year and a half, going on almost two years working together, and uh, you all have done a great job in helping uh, give that future look and, and planning that the the residents are are looking for and, and taking care of our town. So thank you for everything. Okay, thank you, Ms. Vincent. Staff, come on up. I, um, I'm going to go to uh, public comments, whether there's any public comments on this matter. Pierre Lacus, 514 Ashland Avenue. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Kim. Thank you for Allie. And I apologize. I don't know the new lady's name, so forgive me. I've worked. Renee since back in 2004 when she left, I left, or I don't know if it was the other way around. I think I left and she left. <laughs> and then she came back and uh, she came back with someone there that was, I thought at the time was a big foundation. That was Pat McNeese. And then she's been able to build her staff around her. So I appreciate the platitudes that this board bestows upon them. 
Yet, last meeting, you put another burden on their shoulders. Another burden on their shoulders. With the amendment to the extensions, all that stuff, people can look at the last meeting where instead of a year that the staff asked for to help them process things, you cut their legs out, six months, six months. Six months, six months. Let's not forget not only the plans that come in, and you've got a couple of them that are on the agenda tonight, and the plans that come in and that have been having to be revised and go to TRC and do go to the BOA and the planning and zoning and all the preparation and the meetings. And let's throw in the comprehensive plan updates, the strategic plan updates. Tonight, the Greek town uh, consultant and all that, that's all under them. Give them a break. And I am lastly, again, not lastly, I'm gonna keep harping on this. Mark, you know, Ellen started it. We need to have an employee appreciation day again, as we did back then. Do the shifts, have people come from different shifts. We had the food up there. We had all kinds of things going on, gift certificates from local businesses. I don't know how you wanna revamp it, but it's time to uh, reward the employees more than a piece of paper. Thank you. Okay. Any other public comments? Mr. Posh, do you? Um, oh, on just on this good. item, on public comments, we're going to go to that in a minute. Um, go ahead, please come forward. Good evening. My name is Gregory Barnes. I'm. Uh, I live at 1281 Windy Bay Shoal, Tarpon Springs. I would just like to bring up a traffic flow issue that maybe someone... We'll have a... public comments in a minute. This is just for the proclamation that we just did. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you for the proclamation from the citizens of Tarpon for the planning department. These ladies work very hard. And I'm going to tell you, the last two, two and a half, three years, they've been slammed against the wall so many times by citizens who don't know what they're talking about. They badmouth them, they accuse them of all kinds of things, but these ladies are strong. You can't strong arm them, you can't make them bend. The law's a law, and they go by what the city has in ordinances. We're very lucky to have them, and I wish that sometimes you would listen to them, what they're telling you, because they know a little better than you do. Thank you. Okay. Um. Are there any public comments anymore on this proclamation from anyone here in attendance? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got one announcement. Item 14 has been withdrawn, and that's Ordinance 2023-35, Cypress Trails Final Plan Development. That was uh, withdrawn by the applicant, so we'll not be discussing that this evening. So I'm going to go to public comments now. This would be on anything that's not on the agenda. Gary Posh, 1140 South Point Alexis Drive, Tarpon Springs, 34689. Good evening. I'm sure we're all familiar with the movie The Godfather and the scene where the guy says, this is business, this isn't personal. Well, I've lived in Tarpon Springs a little over six years, and I don't have a personal relationship with anyone on this dais. So what I have to say tonight is completely business and not personal. Two weeks ago, the Board of Commission meeting was one for the ages. In that meeting, we had our city auditor present an audit that was instantly the target of vicious personal attacks. One commissioner who claims to be a whiz kid in the field of accounting even offered to help rewrite the audit to reflect what he wanted it to say. Don't worry, my accounting is admissible evidence in a court of law and I can rewrite this so yours can also be admissible. It was unbelievable to hear. If anyone thinks that I'm exaggerating or misstating his words, Please check the YouTube video. It doesn't lie. So rewriting an official audit is now standard operating procedure in Tarpon Springs. It's quite obvious that something is being covered up. A two-year-old could figure that out. And please stop insulting our intelligence by saying there's nothing to see here. 
There obviously is. And for the act of asking to rewrite an official audit, this commissioner needs to resign. He has zero credibility now. And if you think my words are arrogant, they're not one one thousandth as arrogant as what we heard at that meeting. It was unbelievable. As far as the city manager, his actions were equally egregious. It was laid bare for all to see how his style of management is that of bullying, intimidation, and coercion. He's also strangely and intensely contemptuous of Auditor Poulos and his report. It's glaringly apparent that what was uncovered was tantamount to a no-show job. It was also alarmingly apparent that a coordinated effort was made to trash both the work and the reputation of Auditor Poulos. Why are these gentlemen trashing the audit? That's the million dollar question. Now, when repeatedly asked for a retirement date, the city manager has looked the board in the eyes and simply smirked. I've personally seen it from my seat right back there. This utter contempt for the board and the people of Tarpon Springs must have a stop put to it. This board needs to get a binding retirement date tonight or vote to terminate the city manager tonight. Enough is enough. The city will survive. And every word I've uttered here is based 100% on the Board of Commissioners meetings and the backup material. There's nothing personal here. As the old show Dragnet said, just the facts, man, and that's what I've given tonight. Gentlemen, you know what needs to be done. Thank you. Next comment, please. Yes, uh, Gregory Barnes, 1281 Windy Bay Show, Tarpon Springs. I would like to bring uh, to the attention of the city a, a, what I consider a traffic flow problem that at the corner, at the intersection of Spruce Street and US 19, where Lowe's is and between Flammer Ford. Having traveled that intersection quite frequently, I really think it would benefit the flow if going heading west, if the right lane was straight through and right turn and the left lane was left turn only. Because as of now, it's left turn only straight through and the two opposing directions are fighting each other and playing chicken with each other and not everyone uses their, their blinker and it's just, it, it just seems if, if the straight through would be on the right hand lane, everything would flow. People turning right, going straight could flow. People going left could continually uh, go left and not have this playing chicken in the middle of the intersection all the time. So if someone, a traffic engineer, could look at that issue maybe, I would appreciate it. I think it would really help the flow and because the, the light doesn't stay green that, that long anyway and people are really fighting to get across and, and pass through. So I think it would help if someone could take a look at that. Thank you. Uh, sir, you gave us your name and address, is that correct? You, you gave us your name and address for the record? Yes, sir. And I'm, I'm going to ask someone to follow up and explain the circumstances on that. Thank you. Thank you. Tina Bukavalis, 115 Athens Street. And commissioners, you all already know this because I wrote you all a letter, but this is partly for the public too. I just think we should bring it up again. In the city charter, Article 2, Section 8, the first responsibility listed for the Board of Commissioners is to establish dates and times for meetings to listen to and address concerns, ideas, and goals of citizens, businesses, community groups, and staff. Unfortunately, this is not being fulfilled in a satisfactory way by regularly extending meetings past the designated 11 p.m. closing. This does not allow for adequate public comment. Most people actually keep fairly staid schedules. They have work, family responsibilities, and sometimes a pet that wakes them up at 5 a.m. and they're tired. But anyway, you need to take the citizen schedules into consideration. And here are some potential ways to do it. It's not that hard. Earlier start for your meeting, more frequent meetings, maybe carry it over automatically to the next day after 11 o'clock. Um, time limit on each commissioner's comments, 10 minutes max, fewer agenda items, prioritize agenda items according to potential public interest. Whatever the, your strategies you decide to choose, it really is not reasonable to extend a meeting to 1.30 or 2 in the morning. Last time, I, 
I and other people had things we wanted to comment on. I watched everyone walking out after 11, 12. I walked out after 12. <coughs> Next day, I went to look at the meeting. It went on so long, the meeting stopped being recorded because it's only recorded for a certain number of hours. I couldn't even find out what happened. Anyway, please consider taking some action soon. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Buc Dr. Bukovalos. Next, please. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Cassandra James, 230 Parker Place. I'm here this evening to discuss an email that I sent to Mr. Funchen, City Manager and entire Board of Commissioners. I believe that there has been an ample time provided for a response to my letter eight days ago. I haven't received anything. This is in regards to a job offer that was rescinded. I am fully aware that a rescind is not law unlawful and deserves no reason to be given. However, I am here because there were reasons given as mentioned in the email and I feel were inappropriate. The first reason in a nutshell is the concern that employees not know the offer that was given to me, which has since been unfounded. This is a public sector position, which makes the information available to anyone that desires to know it, including fellow employees. It's available online or it only takes a simple FOIA request. The second reason, the most concerning one, suggesting that I would or could have an affair like two employees did six months ago in his department that I had nothing to do with. I don't know those individuals and I have never met them. Insinuating that I would repeat this behavior six months down the road and that he just isn't comfortable with that is not only insulting and repulsive, but unprofessional and disgusting. I only know about this affair because employees from the department that told me was why I, pa I was passed up for the fleet assistant job, which a man now holds that position. Unsettled with the information, I pressed on and continued to interview for positions within the city. Now I find myself with a job offer I accepted and it was rescinded four days later with that same outcome, two times, same department, same reason. This time coming from the man that not only interviewed me, but chose me for the position. Mr. Funchen said he received multiple calls and was putting fires out. One of those calls came from the city manager. It would be interesting to know what that call was about. Rumors, innuendo, insinuation, half or no truths have no place in a hiring process. I'm standing before you in effort to bring understanding and consideration to this matter and defend my right to work for the city of Tarpon Springs. I watched the long seven hour commissioners meeting on the 19th and several times it was mentioned, mentioned that quote, we need to be careful how we speak to people. Be professional. We don't need any more lawsuits, unquote. I couldn't agree more. I now feel that I am being labeled a troublemaker and will be rejected from applying and interviewing for any jobs within the city moving forward. I have not done anything, but I find myself defending my character and integrity. I did not create this situation. I am professional. I am hardworking. I'm ethical and trustworthy. I deserve this job based off my qualifications, personality, and professionalism. I was offered this job for those reasons. I am asking for a review of everything that has been brought to your attention and reconsider the resend. Mr. Funchen said he was offering it to a second interviewer. He would be calling her. If what he told me was a true reason, then why would he call another female to endure the same issue that he doesn't feel comfortable with six months from now? I got off the phone on the 18th when I was offered the job with pure happiness. My prayers have been answered. My future and my family will be safe and secure. Pardon me. Excited to start my next chapter with the city I live in and share my knowledge with peers to make things more streamlined and efficient. To being completely thrown off the rails at no cause of my own, embarrassed and judged, causing grief in my home and personal life that just did not exist before the call from Mr. Funchen. I am asking for reconsideration and put the trust that never should have been lost back into me, knowing that I truly am the correct candidate for the position that was offered to me. If any of you would like to have a discussion, I'm available. I will leave you with this. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Thank you for your time. I look forward to hearing from you and finding the correct resolution to this unfortunate experience. Thank you. Mayor, Mayor. I, I just want to ask Mark a question. Could we I'm not sure, Ms. Kardash, do you want to weigh in on this? Um, my preference is that we 
just allow public comment to continue. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next comment, please. Uh, my name is Mary Zanola, and I live at 1545 North River Circle. And I'm here just to have you guys consider the possibility of placing a flashing light at the intersection of Anclote and Pinellas. About three weeks ago, I held a man, his head in my arms at, after he was struck by uh, a car. He was riding a bicycle very quickly on the <clears throat> sidewalk, on the left side of the road. And the man who hit him was coming out of Anclote and was gonna turn right, never saw him. It's a really dangerous intersection. The bicyclists often tend to just whiz right through it without slowing down, looking or anything. And I guess if, a, if any of us were to hit them, we would be at fault. If, if you could consider a flashing light there or something just to slow down those bicycles careening um, at that intersection, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm sure you'll, someone will contact you about that as well, just to get some more information. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Charlotte Williams. I live at 524 Hibiscus Street. And basically, my comment is a comment of encouragement. When you hear the word legacy, when we speak about legacy for our families, we want to leave something behind. We want to leave character. We want to leave something that our children and grandchildren can benefit from. And now I challenge you, let's leave a legacy in Tarkin Springs where this town can be, the citizens can be proud of. The citizens can be proud of, the, of whoever and whatever prospective places you have on the board. Sometimes all it takes is just to enhance someone else's idea, how to critique it to make Tarpon better. Why can't we make Tarpon the best? So in Pinellas County, so oh, other cities would want to copy what we have here. And then who knows, it can even go to the state level. We have a lot here to offer. And there's so much knowledge here in this room that the entire, the entire Tarpon Springs area can be great. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening, Juliana Day, 413 East Oakwood Street, Topham Springs, Florida. As I was looking at the agenda and going through the um, governor part of the commissioner, I came upon this part, and it's about a promise. The mayor left no promise. Vice mayor left no promise. Um, commissioner Mike, your promise is to listen to the residents and to install honesty and common sense in all his decision making. Peter, no promise, but you want to focus to protect the city, the Topham Springs way of life of current and future generations to preserve small town charm. Um, Mr. John, no promise, but you do believe in the progress with the emphasis on preservation of the heritage that makes Topham Springs unique. That part there that you all promised and um, focused on when you came here on the board is about the residents of Toppin Springs and to keep this city in the same mode as it was. It's like, when are you going to evolve? When are you going to be like the butterfly? When are you going to evolve? And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Day. Is there any other public comments from anyone in attendance here? Peter Delac is 514 Ashland Avenue. First, uh, before I begin readings, um, 
I would like to reiterate a little bit what Dr. Bukovala said. Uh, there's no reason that that meeting had to go on until two o'clock past two. None of it was urgent. It couldn't have been postponed to the next day. And a lot of it was petty. And I have to apologize to our attorney, Ms. Kardash, because you put a big burden on her. She didn't leave till two o'clock. And from what I understand, you live a distance from here. And by the time you get home, and if you got a hearing the next morning, and other staff that has to wait, Ron Herring or Paul or Tom or... So I guess what I'm gonna read about is about uh, knowing yourselves and others. So this is Romans 12, uh, basically three through 19. For, the, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. We have different gifts according to a grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve it. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. It is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him have govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual, serve, your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, and live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, be, but be willing to associate with people of low position, and do not be conceited. Do not pay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. So look at your behaviors over the last few months and see what you can do to reconcile yourselves and make this a more efficient process. And I apologize for any more time that I've taken. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any, yes, ma'am. Taylor, 1991 Douglas Lane, Tarpon Springs. I just wanted to uh, briefly say uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Fonchina and um, the Parks Department for meeting with the um, Dorset Park Revitalization Committee, working on Dorset Park. They got a new piece of uh, play equipment for the kids, and we thank them and thank Mark for meeting with us also uh, to improve the park. Maybe we can get a splash pad rather than a splash park because of the budget, but we're working on that. Hopefully some of those things will start hitting the agenda. And I wanted to thank um, Linda Eisner with the uh, Garden Club to meet with us, with our committee. We're working on an event for next year for um, Arbor Day on Ju uh, January 19th. We'll be scheduling a meeting with Mark on that. And also um, uh, Joan Jennings with the uh, Art, Art Council also thanking them for the things that they're doing to help Dorset Park Revitalization Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Are there any public comments from anyone here in, in the auditorium? Yes, Gustavo Castillo, 109 North Gross Avenue. Um, I would like to um, request from city leaders that um, 
special attention be paid to the very visible um, homeless population that is starting to develop within the city limits. Um, I would like to encourage you, all of you, to um, perhaps start looking at projects that help this population, uh, also perhaps help the low-income um, citizens that work within the city limits. I can, I can tell that there's a shortage of um, low-income low housing options for, um, or apartments for these people um, that probably work at restaurants, you know, dishwashers and waiters and all that that would likely benefit from being able to live within uh, close distance of their uh, place of employment. Um, for that, I want to say that I, I, I like that the city is starting to uh, look at the uh, Habitat for Humanity uh, lots, uh, and that's, that's needed as well, but also um, the, the lack of options for people that are unhoused. So with that, I want to thank you all of you, uh, and please start paying attention to this because it's going to become a larger problem the more you wait. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else uh, have a public comment here in the auditorium on anything that's not on the agenda? Mr. Chomp, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Ms. Jacobs. We do have one public comment from R.G. Kentodiakis, 832 Riverside Drive. I am super excited that you're thinking about adding courts to the Riverside location. Thank you. It has to do with pickleball. Okay. That's it? Yes. That's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to go to the um, consent agenda. I'm going to ask um, whether any commissioners wish to pull any of the items for questions. I pull two and six. Six? Two and six. Two and six. Okay. Anyone else? I'd like to pull number four. Okay. Um, so may I have a, uh, we'll go to public comments, but I'd like to have a, a motion on item one, three, and five for approval and uh, in a second, and then we'll go to public comments and commission uh, comments. <clears throat> motion, motion to, to approve, approve consent agenda items one, three, and five. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Um, public comments. Are there any public comments on these agenda items? This is items one, three, five. Mr. Jump, any remote access comments? If anyone has comments they'd like to make on these items, please raise your hand. You'll be allowed in to talk. raise hands at this time. Okay. Um, Vice Mayor Lund, would you like to, oh, I'm sorry, we've got a motion and a second. If there's no further commission comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lund? Yes. Mayor Vadigaris? Yes. Uh, Vice Mayor Lund, you pulled item number two. Would you like to discuss um, that? Yeah, I have one question. Um, this is to authorize the execution of a grant funding extension. I wanted to know uh, what, if any, were the costs of the city. Obviously, if we're extending the grant, we're extending the time for the lease on the property, et cetera. Could you sort of summarize where that's taking the city for me, please? Sure can. I'm Bob Robertson, Project Administration Department Director. Um, first part of your question, there was no additional cost to extend the grant. Um, I think what you're hitting at is that because the project was delayed, the costs are, are, are mounting. Is that kind of what you mean by that? Well, yeah, if we're extending the grant, we're all obviously extending everything else. I just wanted to know if there was any associated costs. Not such was extending the grant, just extending the time period. No, no direct costs. All right, that's fine then. Thank you. Okay, are there any other commissioner comments? Okay, may I have a, um, I'm gonna go public comments. Are there any public comments on this item? This has got to do with uh, extending the grant for the Anklo River dredging. It's a state grant, is that correct, Mr. Robinson? Yes, state yes, sir. grant. Uh, Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone would like to make a comment on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And 
we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay. Thank you. May I have a motion and a second to approve? Please? Motion to approve number two, authorize execution of Anclo Dredge Project grant second. funding extension. Okay, and there's a second already, Vice Mayor Lowe? Is that your second? Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, item four, I pulled out um, on the Alford Spur Trail Project. Um, that's something that all of us have got <laughs> an interest in. I especially, um, I saw the bids, the, the, the RPs came in significantly higher than what our, our budget is. So I'd, I'd like to ask what is the plan for going forward given that there was that much of a difference between what we've got budgeted. And I mean, I'd like to think that there was a mistake on three contractors parts on those bid amounts, but I doubt that's gonna be the case. So um, what are the plans? Bob, we go. Sure. Um, so the first step is uh, I went back with our engineer. We had a, a, a meeting. We did a little value engineering. We're going to um, redesign parts of the trail, just reduce some quantities and put the project back out to bid. We're going to narrow the trail in some places, reduce the depth of the subgrade, um, try to trim the, the high dollar items that were in the bid. And, and I think we can get back into something that we can afford. Um, as far as... Uh maybe approaching the county for the Pinellas County for their help. Is there any thought about that or? Uh, in terms of uh, funding help? Yes. Um, I haven't done that yet. No, we probably could do that at some point. But I think we should. I mean, <laughs> I think they might be interested in what our bids have come in given what our budget was. And, and I would suspect they're not interested in holding this spur up either. Um, the other part of this is what would be the time frame for going back out to bid? I mean, we've got plans to revise or they're all done? They're all done. I'm just going to put notes on the plans. It's not, they aren't, they aren't significant changes that require a whole redesign, just enough to change the quantities. So I could theoretically put this out in the next week or two, depending on procurement schedule. In a week? Mm -hmm. Week okay. or two. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Are there any other commission comments? Y yes, Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, um, hang on a second. Let me go to public comments. Are there any public comments on this item? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to make a comment on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay. Um, Commissioner Kulias. Yes. Bob, I just wanted to follow up and ask, has there, um, have you received any information regarding that uh, section right before the trestle that's uh, controlled by the county? As it's caved in a little bit about any progress about fixing it? I don't have any information on that, no. Okay, thank you. I, they are working on that, and I think that's where, <laughs> that's where it's going to be the problem if we try to ask the county for money, because it looks like it's going to be a substantial dollar amount fixed that they're working on with their engineers. Um, so they are working, but right now it looks like there's some substantial um, work that needs to be done at a high cost. So I'll let you know as soon as I hear anything about that, let the board know. And that portion is still closed off? Yes. Right, so, okay. Thank you. Any other commission comments? Uh, we have a motion to approve item four and a second, please. Motion to approve, motion to approve item four. Second. second, okay. Ms. Jacobs, roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, item six, um, I've got some comments, but Vice Mayor Lunt, uh, would you like to um, proceed? Sure. I'm not trying to pick on you again, Renee. I'm sorry I couldn't get back to you on the phone. Okay. One of those weeks. Um, so I have a couple of comments and a couple of questions about this. Um, first of all, what we're looking at is a place where the consultant so initial bid was only $250 less than their competitor's bid, which I thought was a little close the first time. Um, but now the winning bidder wants another 10%, another $5,000 to do what I see was finishing his job. So um, was what they're asking for not in the original scope? No. The, what? What's being requested at this point is some additional funding specifically for to produce some visual concepts and renderings at, at a couple of different um, 
public spots in the docks, things that, you know, so they're, and we'll use those during our conceptual, uh, excuse me, our community engagement workshop coming up on October 18th. Um, this is not critical to have. This is, you know, additional things that would really enhance the process, but. So it, this is basically display boards for their concept of how to redo our marina front, how to redo our sponge it, talk it, front. It, yeah, vi visual representations of, of conceptual improvements in those areas, things that, um, that, you know, aren't tremendously expensive, but things that could visually enhance these different areas, they're, they're placemaking you know, efforts essentially. So we wanted some visual representations um, for the public to be able to respond to. And we just didn't anticipate that during the original scope. Was, uh, was the scope of this RFP, I'm sorry, I don't have the whole thing in my head. Was, this, was the scope of this RFP only to look at city owned properties? Essentially, I mean, it's, it's looking at, so it's two things. One, it was looking at what are the, um, is there public support for creating a, like a Greek town, actual historic district with design guidelines or something like a conservation district or an expansion of the smart code area? So this was being driven by requests from, from interested citizens. Um, so that was one piece of it is the, the engagement and engaging the community um, to, to get answers to those and to get direction. It's not actually creating design guidelines at this point. And then the second piece was what are the opportunities on publicly owned property, rights of way and things of that nature where there may be opportunities to, to improve those areas visually um, uh, and you know, for the benefit of tourists and, and residents. So that, that was the fact to kind of encapsulate the scope. That's what it was. Okay. so. Did the city specifically within the scope of the of the bid or otherwise during this process, did the city specifically ask for conceptual enhancement plans or is this just a suggestion by the consultant? There it was discussed between us and, and us and the and then the consultant. So it, it was it a mutual first, was agreement. The consultant that brought it up? It was the consultant and staff. All right. Um, I have another question too. Um, part of this whole scope includes a robust community engagement effort utilizing in-person workshops, stakeholder meetings, um, the Connect Tarpon Springs online platform, and other media to uh, solicit public information, et cetera. Um, <coughs> what stakeholders have actually been interviewed? Um, Caroline, do you have that list? We, we have a, a list of stakeholders that was developed by the consultant. Um, a lot of them are major property owners. Um, and business owners, um, who else? Do you know how many interviews have been conducted at this point? I don't have the number, I, I don't have that number. All, but can this cons, list be are, made available? Excuse me? I said, can this list it be can made be. publicly the available? The list can be made available to you, yes. Um, how was that list derived? Was it derived from the consultant? Was it derived it was, by our planning department? It was derived largely by the consultant and um, Karen Lemons helped us from the economic development side. Um, so we, we're, what we're looking at, the, the, the big long range picture is we're looking at the, rede the areas in the, in the docks, the privately owned properties that are most likely to redevelop. So those are the large tracts of land. So there was definitely an interest in um, and getting the input of those property owners. Um, the, you know, we do want to get, uh, as well as, you know, business owners. And, and we've talked with, um, we do, I don't know, I know we've reached out to the, to the Greek town group or the, um, the not-for-profit group. Um, I don't know if those interviews have been set up yet, but we are, they are a stakeholder. Um, so individual residents per se, we're not necessarily, because there's so many residents, we hope to gather all that through, uh, we have our, our community engagement workshop is on October 18th. It'll be here. So uh, we haven't really we haven't really discussed anything with the public except for what's been on Connect the, Tarpon Springs. Which went on exactly. Um, okay, so the, the only thing I have uh, to mention here is we're 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 talking about extending the contract value of this with a with the uh, consultant. And yet item number seven on our agenda is 
is to do with the same consultant. I'm going to move that we table item seven until, or item six until item number seven is settled. That's a motion. That's a motion. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Are there any comments on the commission? Yeah, I was actually, you know, uh, confused between consent agenda six and special consent seven. And so I'm happy he was able to bring it up in that manner. And one of the issues is, is possibly that, you know, the stakeholders or, you know, the organization that helped move forward is, uh, uh, may have not given so much input as of right now to this point. And so there, you know, there may be a worry that some of the conceptual designs that pop up, you know, that may be created that, um, there wasn't enough input from some of the stakeholders. So uh, I'm hoping that in this item seven coming up, we can give a direction to help uh, get some of the stakeholders and, and businesses to, uh, down in the sponge docks an opportunity to work with planning and stand tech to help maybe create some first conceptual designs if that's the case, but uh, mainly just trying to get them more involved uh, in this next in discussion is what I think we're gonna probably focus on with special consent agenda seven. So, thank you. Are there any other commission comments on this? Go ahead, Commissioner Eisner. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, I had some similar questions to what the Vice Mayor had asked. So I would need to see what we, what Santec, uh, Stantec spent with that 49,750. I also had concerns with the $250 difference and then they came back with a $5,000 um, you know kicker on it I uh, don't know who the interested citizens are that you speak of I would need to know who they did speak with um, and I just also don't know why they brought they're bringing now in the marina and the visitor center because I don't know if that has anything to do with the Greek community um, so I don't know why in, in my eyes, it, it makes me think that they underbid it and they're just trying to add things in. So I need more clarification on what was spent, how they approach this, because this um, backup material just doesn't have what I'm looking for. So um, I would need a lot more facts and figures. So that's my comment on that. Uh, see, Manager LaCourse, you have your light on. Yes, I just like to recommend that we pull this item, and and as as you said, as Commissioner Coolio said, we wait. If we're going to do any of those things, we do it after the further meetings and stuff. And so I agree with that. And I think I'd like to pull this pull this item and not go for approval. We have a motion and a second on yeah. the table. That the only way we're going to do that is to withdraw the motion. Or do you want to have a vote on it? The table for reconsideration after seven, but we can go ahead and vote on the table. We could oh, vote on the table or we could vote to dismiss it entirely. Uh, let's just go ahead and I mean, vote on the table. The recommended recommendation to uh, table the item is, is like the motion and the second that's on the floor. Uh, and let me, um, did you want to um, ask public were there comment? any other, for me? Did you want to ask public comment? Yes, um, okay. Um, I've got some things to say, but I'm gonna wait till after the, uh, actually I'm gonna wait for item seven, so. Um, <laughs> Are there any public comments on the tabling of this motion? We're gonna have a, a full discussion, which could include some of the elements that you see here um, on the next item, number seven. They're all together. Are there any public comments on this item? Um, Mr. Jump, are there any uh, remote access comments? If anyone online would like to make a comment, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. and we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Jacobs, you noted that there was an a, a, a item for the consent agenda, was this it? Um, it says for six and seven, it concerns. Um, let's go ahead and read it. Okay. It's part of public comment, and then we're gonna table it, but then it'll apply to item seven as well. Go ahead. This is from Artemis Kusathanis, 541 Division Street. I feel it is very important to preserve and maintain the historical integrity of our city. New projects, whether residential or commercial, should have limitations on size and aesthetics to fit a consistent historic, historical look and feel. I am thankful to see progress in this direction. Okay, thank you. 
um, if there's no further commission comments, then I'm gonna reserve mine till later. Um, roll call, please. Commissioner Kulianis? Yes. Commissioner Kuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay, uh, hang on, Ms. Benson. Okay, we're gonna to go to the, um, that ends the consent agenda. We're gonna to go to the cons special consent agenda. This is a um, discussion and direction on the Greektown Historic Heritage District. Um, this is something that I asked to be put on the item. I had a meeting with several residents concerning this matter. There were questions that were asked of me that as one commissioner, uh, they were policy related that I couldn't answer. I forward the um, uh, request to have this item on the agenda. Also with what the general questions were that were asked of me. I know in the backup, Ms. Vincent has provided responses to most of those. So I'm gonna let Ms. Vincent, if that's acceptable, to yes. go ahead and discuss yes. this. So um, I, again, I tried to provide a response to your questions, Mayor. Uh -huh. um, to you can so, read the question too, if you'd like. Or. Yeah, I'm not sure which questions that you were concer most concerned about or that maybe didn't get answered. So the timeline for completing the district implementation, including design guidelines, um, that's somewhat open-ended. Um, as I stated just a second ago, the, you know, this effort itself does not include drafting design guidelines. We will get recommendations about what should be included. We're getting the community input into what should happen in terms of should there be a conservation district? Um, should there be you know, an overlay district? Should there be a full-blown historic district like we have in the national and the local district? Um, so you know, that, is, that is a policy decision to be decided based on the outcomes of, of the study. So um, if you know, once we ha <clears throat> have that presentation and recommendation from the consultants, which we expect toward the end of the year, then that will be a question for this board to decide you know, with public input, how do we want to move forward? Um, in any of those scenarios, if they're, you know, you, I guess you kind of have like maybe four, you know, a full blown historic district. Um, we have a process now to, you know, we could enact an historic district, you know, under our existing land development code, you know, and establish, you know, design guidelines, you know, there's not a tremendous amount of work that would need to be done. Um, new work uh, to put in a set of design guidelines. <clears throat> Most of the, a lot of the structures, a lot of overlap with our existing historic district. So um, if, if it's more of a conservation type of district, which is a little less intensive, um, again, you know, that would require uh, a little bit of land development code work, but again, fully within the, the realm of what we can do at the sta with staff. Um, you know, or if we choose to perhaps expand, expand the smart code area and put, put a specific character district over Greek town, again, those are all things that, you know, possible avenues once we go through this placemaking um, uh, and, and engagement process with the consultants. So um, again, but timeline on that, you know, probably six months from the time that we get recommendations, we could have those ready for hearings. Um, funding. I'm sorry, uh, six months from the end of the study? Correct. Once, I mean, once we have direction, we need to know what, what, what is the policy going to be? Is it going to be to put in a full blown historic district? You know, we, so, you know, I would, you know, estimate four to six months to, to do that work. Um, right. And then the study is ending when? Study should be, um, the draft study should be completed within, I believe we said November, um, preliminarily and then final at the, at the beginning of the year. End of November. Yeah, it's so a draft by the end of November and then finaled by, um, by the first of the year would, for final, final looking, findings and adoption. We're, we're looking at, uh, as far as the establishment of something and completing of something, is that correct? by June of 2024? That, uh, that would be an estimate, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I know I, when we kind of get into this discussion, when commissioner comments, that's just for clarification, sure. I've got more to say on that, but sure. please continue. Okay. Um, regarding, let me see. Funding needs to complete the project. Uh, the board did include $35,000 in the FY24 budget for ongoing work. Um, we don't have anything earmarked on that as we speak. 
um, and what our needs would be moving forward, actually drafting design guidelines or conservation district would be, you know, that would be staff time and, and public outreach, public notices, mailings and things of that nature. So um, yeah, we don't anticipate needing really, so far as the, you know, that aspect. If physical improvements so that comes out of the placemaking aspect of the, you know, so if there's some improvements that you want to go ahead and incorporate, whether it's the marina or other public spaces, that those obviously would have to be based on, you know, what those actual projects are. Okay. Um, Trade-offs with partnering local preservation is preservation associates instead of hiring consultants. We certainly, if once we know what direction we're going, whether it's going to be a conservation district or historic district or what, you know, we will continue obviously to work with. If we have that direction and there's and the public interest is there and that's what we want, then obviously we will continue to work with the you know the interested uh, stakeholders, you know, and the, the Greek Talent Association to to draft draft those design guidelines and work with them. Okay. We weren't, you know, anticipating, we were not anticipating hiring, having a consultant to draft those design guidelines or the, whatever the uh, you know, overlays or anything of that nature. Um, and then creating an ordinance, I think I already spoke to that. I mean, we have a process today. If the board told us staff go implement an historic district designation over the existing National Register Cultural District, we have a process today in our code to, to do that. So, it, and that, you know, again, probably four to six months to do something like that. Okay. Um, before we go to commissioner comments, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, ask for public comments on this item. Um, are there any public comments? Tina Pocavallis, 115 Athens Street, and I am the president of the Greek Town Preservation and Heritage Association, which uh, initiated the budget items that uh, came before you about this project. Um, according to Connect Tarpon Springs, the purpose is to develop a resident-driven vision plan to enhance the Greek Town Historic District's his historic and cultural character provide guidelines for sustainable historic preservation, preserve and enhance the working waterfront, develop functional and vibrant public spaces for residents and tourists, and pro promote sustainable economic uh, development. Since project initiation in February, um, and by the way, whatever I say, I do respect the staff. I know you're totally overworked, and I also know some of your priorities are not set by you but in a larger picture. So the, don't take anything as a criticism. Um, uh, but public activity since February has been limited to two online surveys, uh, which could have been taken by Joe Schmo from Cleveland who visited the docks when he was five. There is no way to vet respondents to online surveys. And um, a lot of us were asking in the last couple of weeks, has anyone been contacted about stakeholder interviews? The answer was no. The first contact that anyone knows about was me after the agenda came out on Friday afternoon. You know, I got a call to set up uh, a stakeholder survey as early as Monday. And I asked them, who are you, who else are you interviewing? You know, it was our entire group as one stakeholder. And they said, well, other than you, only businesses. Um, and I got that same message again from Stantec, only businesses uh, were the stakeholders other than us. Um, and that there hadn't been anything to date. So, and I was told by them that that direction came from the city. Um, from our perspective, core stakeholders are those who live or own property in the district, have deep family roots in the district, or who work or have long-term businesses, because frankly, there's some very short-term businesses also. So I'm wondering why, and why they were advised mostly to talk to business owners since we're not dealing just with the business district 
And who advised Dantec only to, to talk to the businesses? Um, I'm a little thrown off because this is out of focus, but I just want to say the marina and the visitor center is not in the district. It is not a contributing property. So I feel like there is some misunderstanding uh, or that people haven't done their homework about what's in the district and what isn't. But what we're looking at is, and what was just said on Connect Tarpon is our understanding was that there were going to be guidelines at the end of this, that there were going to be broad stakeholder interviews, and that, that there were going to be public meetings, and that was going to drive the project, you know, rather than being driven by, by the ideas only of Stantec, you know, and the staff uh, at first, you know. First, we need public input, which is what you said before, and then we need the, the ideas to be formulated. Uh, there's some other things I think we need to know about. Um, I don't know what the adopted plan review is. I'd like to know about that. I really do think we need a timeline so that this can get done. Um, how have funds been expended to date in the letter from um, Stantec requesting more money? Um, there was a discussion that they've had discussions and were, uh, and were directed to do these plans. Ms. Ansa Marcus is uh, given her uh, two minutes to Dr. Bukovalas for the record. Please proceed. So, um, I feel I feel there does need to be a greater deal of partnership on this project with um, with um, the stakeholders and uh, with people in the district, and we haven't seen a lot of that so far. Um, I think the uh, suggestion to create an ordinance uh, uh, to make this uh, some kind of official historic district, um, I think a lot of us would prefer something like a conservation district, but that would be invaluable because many of us involved in the association have been going up before boards like the PNC board or board of adjustments who have often sympathized with us about inappropriate buildings and development in the district, but have had no teeth to be able to do anything, you know, because there's nothing there. Why can't we have a consultant? This was supposed to be part of the project. Why couldn't those guidelines be put in place by June? Anyway, um, I urge the board to request uh, full Greek town project information for the next uh, meeting on the 17th. And um, I thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, please, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Callie Toth Mingledorf. I live at 317 High Street, Tarpon Springs. And um, just for those of you to know who I am and my family, I'm born and raised here in Tarpon Springs. And I'm the daughter of Mary and Bill Toth, a granddaughter of Anthony and Fotolirius, and the sister of Nicholas Toth. Um, so we are stakeholders and we are you know, lifelong residents with a legacy and a love for Tarpon Springs. So um, have an interest and was just basically wanting to make comments that have really have already been stated, but the importance of this project, but understanding that we thought it would be more um, stakeholder driven. And I think some of the stakeholders might not even know that the project's going on. Um, so with how we could have direction for the consulting group without, and I quote, the robust community engagement that that's been missing. So it, it kind of leads to how do we have the direction of any type of renderings or how do we have the direction for um, anything without this robust input in, in person and, and the workshops. And I would envision that there probably would need to be more than one workshop because it's gonna kind of, I'm sure there's gonna be confusion. <laughs> it should be a very robust meetings um, that I would envision. But you know, hopefully again, we can just have, I, I guess just a more transparent process and um, just 
just having it be more involved, I guess I'm a little concerned with when it was mentioned that large tracts of land, the landowners who own large tracts because there might be a redevelopment, which is a little scary because we're trying to kind of understand keeping the integrity of the historic um, perspective of the of the Greek town that you know let's let's involve all small business owners large business owners residents which my family is both we have a long time business and we also have residential property so that is just those are my comments I just look forward to just just the the, the being driven more by the public involvement and the public understanding of what the scope of this is because people can't embrace it if we don't understand it. And we have to, I, I would assume that the consulting group, because they were chosen because they've done this before with other communities in some way, that they have renderings they can show us the types of things that can they can do, but not specific to Tarpon Springs yet when you haven't even received any feedback from the Greek town residents. So that would be my concern as far as also the public spaces. What public spaces are those even critical? You know, what, what are we doing and what are we, you know, what's that direction? So that's all. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. And I look forward to the success of this project. I think it's very important for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Peter Crusathanas. I'm at 1508 Poinsettia in Tarpon Springs. Um, I've owned properties in Greek Town in the past and some in the historic district. Um, I think the vision plan, I just want to say that I think the vision plan is uh, important for the area, that uh, the guidelines uh, to preserve um, historical structures and historic neighborhoods and to prevent inappropriate development that doesn't <coughs> fit within uh, the confines of those uh, neighborhoods is also important throughout all the little historic villages that we have here on the Gulf Coast, Pinellas County, uh, and especially Tarpon Springs. I mean, this town's getting a lot of action these days in, in terms of it being known for how cute it is and how special it is and, and uh, how it does have um, a uniqueness to it, a historical integrity to it. Um, it is important, I think, that um, that it's not just the businesses from down in the Greek town area get involved in having a say, but also property owners and then citizens in general throughout town. The project's been on the books for a while. I understand you guys have set up some timelines for what your realistic expectations are to, uh, to see um, you know, something come to fruition soon. I hope that is the case. Um, uh, it is important as well to do something about the docks and to try to uh, make the docks look maybe a little bit more historic in terms of how they looked maybe years ago, if that's possible, and to kind of, you know, see what they have to say there. But uh, it's also important to uh, go back further from the docks and into the neighborhood and also protect the neighborhood. Uh, I work a lot um, all the way from, say, Newport Ritchie all the way down to St. Petersburg uh, in Pinellas County doing historical preservation work. And I end up seeing a lot of things happening in St. Pete that are not so good because uh, there's nothing in place to protect um, neighborhoods and to protect, um, well, complete neighborhoods. Um, you know, houses themselves getting torn down for much bigger houses being built on small lots and backyards turning into little postage stamps and things <coughs> like that. And, and, you know, people do tend to complain about it because it changes the whole atmosphere of what drew people to a place to begin with. If you don't have ordinances in place, and if you don't um, make an effort to protect certain things, um, people and money will come in and usually kind of wipe those things out and do whatever they want to do. And oftentimes, since we don't really have, you know, um, um, a design force in place uh, within a city, people build whatever they want, and sometimes that isn't so pretty. And um, it destroys a neighborhood. It can destroy a town. It's definitely happening down there. Um, they find it hard to believe down there that Tarpon Springs has a historical preservation uh, district and that people can't tear houses down um, just because they own the property, uh, that they have to respect that. And um, 
you know, it's, it was kind of uh, forward thinking what happened years ago to, to put that in place. Uh, it didn't pass in the Greek town area, but I think it's probably time to do something to protect the Greek town area. That's kind of what I have to say on it. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other public comments? Here to Lex 514 Ashland Avenue. Uh, I appreciate everybody's comments with regards to buildings and the residential area and the culture that remains there. But this gentleman just mentioned something about recreating what the docks were. And I drove through the docks on Sunday and on the north side there's these kind of fancy yachts. There's like four of them, they all look alike. But if you look, go to the Craig Park Heritage Museum in there and you see pictures, what do you see? Pictures of boats with sponges. That's what people remember Tarpon for. So, how do we get that? We're dredging the channel. We're trying to make it more amenable. One of the things that happened to hit my head, a while back we had a Marine uh, Citizens Committee we put together with this Julie from Pelican, the Cox Seafood, a whole bunch of the Marine to what to do about our working waterfront. It's nice to talk about all the buildings, but you really want to help revitalize the docks in the area, work on your working waterfront. I mentioned this once before. You do it in the CRA, you offer grants to help people fix their buildings, offer grants to boaters to come in, to offer them to go to school to learn how to do sponge diving. They can commit to a certain time frame to dock at the docks and, and sponge dive. There's ways to increase the usage of the docks. The same thing I noticed, I know Marine Max, that's who it is who has those fancy yachts. They bought that place across the way. I think they're gonna put in a marina over there and do all the repair boats. You're gonna have people coming in. So we need to look at also working on our working waterfront. So that does not need to be neglected also. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other public comments here on this item? Are there any other public comments? Go ahead. Um, okay. Um, if there's no further public comments from anyone in the auditorium, Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay. Um, Ms. Jacobs, we took any emails out in the previous item, is that correct? Okay. Um, let me go to the commission now and, and um, um, I've, I've got some things I want to say and then I want to go to Vice Mayor Lunt, let him finish up and then we can go to the other commissioners um, by seniority. Um, first of all, um, uh, you know, the residents involved in this are not going to go away and I think we need to be real mindful of who we work for and what their interests are. And I, I, I want us to listen a little closer to what they're saying. I, I know we've got some stakeholders with, um, uh, that are larger properties and things of that nature, but are there any of those stakeholders here tonight? I don't know, but I do see a bunch of residents here that are here tonight that are concerned about this. Um, the one thing is, this is already a national district. It's on the books. I think it's been on the books since 2015, I believe, or somewhere, okay, thank you. And um, so we just haven't adopted it uh, as, a, as in a, any of our ordinances. So that's part of this process. It's already been there. And it's not an issue of recreating as much as preserving. And, and that's the way I see it. It's the preserve a way of life, just we, the way we did it with our traditional local district um, around Craig Park and, and the um, fruit salad streets. Um, that seems to have been working out very well. Um, the renderings for the marina, I, I, I mean, similar like myself, it's, it, it's not a contributing structure 
And I'm not sure why we're doing renderings from a consultant without even it being bounced off any of the residents or people that have had an interest in this thing for a very long time. My only recommendation there would just be to focus on the task at hand, which is the district, the National Historic District, and what it is going to involve to get an ordinance on the books. Um, I do want to see a timeline. I know, Ms. Vincent, we're talking about 2024, June of 2024. I'd like to see a, something a little more specific with exactly what, our, what your expectations are on this and, and so we can all talk from the same thing rather than just recollection from a commission meeting. The other thing, I, I know that there's a lot of focus on the sponge docks, but again, it, that's, that is certainly a commercial area and between the river and the sponge docks, it's the main economic engine for the city. I, I fully recognize that and it's really, really important. And um, I do think that there's some work that needs to be done on that to kind of preserve that in, in terms of in perpetuity, um, making sure that we've got sponge boats operating out of the sponge docks in, in the future. Um, the sponges are what people come to see, the people that walk up and down the streets. Also the quaintness of the location and, and the fact that it, it, it's, it's nice. It's not hugely expensive. We're not asking people for $25 for this and $50 for that. They, they seem to come and enjoy that area. Um, and we do have some excellent uh, restaurants. The one thing I've got concern, and Ms. Vincent, I don't know if that photo, that drawing is still on there. I put one on each of the uh, commission's uh, desk. I think our ordinance, and, and we kind of talk about things in a very simplistic way, but I think it's more complicated than that. Um, we do have the historic district and we have the local district and we've got that center area that's an intersection of both. And I, I want to really make sure um, you can't have, I don't think it's going to be an issue of having one or the other. I think we've got historic preservation guidelines, but now we're looking at adopting a historic, um, a Greek town historic district and, and somehow Again, I like the word integrated. That has to be integrated to make sure that we don't lose that. And, and it's interesting, I also looked at the plaque that we put down there memorializing the sponge docks, the historic district. And basically, I, I was a little, I'd forgotten that it actually went from Tarpon Avenue north. And I, I went down and took a look at the, uh, the plaque and actually that, that describes exactly the boundaries of what was on the National Register. So I don't know that, uh, I, I, maybe there could be an argument that what you adopt locally doesn't have to reflect what's on the national level. I, I really don't want to get into a debate of that. I, I think that it is what it is and, and it is what was um, applied for and what was recognized. And it is a cultural district as well, much less just a strictly historic district. So those are my thoughts on all of this tonight. Um, the funding gets back to uh, I've always asked you about funding. I'm not shy about asking you about funding. I don't want the work done because there's a lack of funding. That's my point, not we're spending too much or anything like that. I wanna make sure that you have enough of what you need to get things done. And, um, and I'm, again, I think that ordinance is gonna be a little more complicated. And I, 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 it's gonna be up to you as to whether you're gonna need some help but it could be a very complicated matter of trying to do the sponge docks, uh, I'm sorry, a Greektown Historic District Ordinance. You've got the other historic, the historic district that we've already got and somewhere that, that ordinance or maybe not, maybe the other one, there has to be some accommodation of how you're gonna handle that center intersection of the both districts. And so um, that's what I wanted to say tonight um, is, is one, Let's listen to our residents and, and, um, and, and um, I, I, again, I didn't have the answers for them. You provided some of that. I'm gonna follow up um, with this request for timelines and things of that nature. So uh, thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Love. Thanks. So comment wise, I've been a proponent of this project since its inception. I think everybody knows that. I'm not happy with what we've done with it so far. Greek Town is more than just the sponge docks. It's the residents that live there. It's more than just the tourists and the tourist dollars. Um, 
So I'm not happy that we've done anything close to a robust canvassing of, of what they need in that area. I'm, I'm really, really not happy with that. Um, until that is done, I don't think there's anything to visualize. It's a blank sheet of paper. There's not enough information there. Any visualization would be the consultant's idea of what should be done. Well, I don't want the consultant's idea of what should be done. I want the consultant's interpretation of what the people want to be done, what they think their neighborhood should look like, what they want to protect and conserve. And I, I tend to lean to more, toward the, more towards the conservation area uh, because I think putting a, a strict historical district on it might be a little bit too much given from what I've heard when we approached that subject before. I think a, a conservation district would ease us into it. It would allow us to present guidelines that, that could be adhered to without having to you know tie everybody up for eight months trying to figure out whether they can put shutters on their windows or not, that sort of thing. Um, but from the overall thing for this, I mean, I, I agree with the mayor. If we need additional funding, let's talk about it. But let's talk about it later. I want to see the results of the consultants' survey, their interactions with all the stakeholders, not just some sort of ephemeris list of large property holders and businesses. I want to see them get out and talk to the neighborhoods because people live there. People jog there, people walk there, people hang out at coffee shops there. These are not the tourists, these are residents of Tarpon Springs. It's their neighborhood. Um, anyway, I'm sorry for going off on uh, such a tangent about uh, this. Not at all. <laughs> I'm pretty passionate about this area. I understand. I think we need to conserve it, I think we need to protect it, and I think the, the residents and the businesses need the respect paid to them from the consultant to get their opinion. And I won't be happy at all until those opinions are gathered. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Forgive me for not looking at you, but I wanna read from this. <clears throat> Excuse me. First thing I wanted to say was, um, Vice Mayor, you gotta get out of my head when you speak. You take my questions right. Um, what I wanna zero in on is your memorandum um, that says the scope of this project includes a robust community engagement. Um, as I read those five things, gathering information, analyzing existing conditions, um, review existing plans and codes, I have no idea what they've done or what they haven't done. Um, then they, number five is recommendations for preservation area and action scale to small and large budget possibilities. When I read this, um, and I don't want to read all of the wording in here, it's more so a word salad. And it, it sums it up to me, at least from this, that not very much was done, um, except for a lot of words. And you have here um, an area where it says the following activities have taken place to date. So it's two surveys completed through Connect Tarpon Springs, but isn't Tar Connect Tarpon Springs what we as a city do? It is not to do what, we didn't pay Stantec to uh, put two surveys for Connect Tarpon Springs, did we? They developed the surveys, we pushed them out through our platform, that is our community engagement platform, and that was, that was the way it was detailed in the scope that we would use that. Okay, so what I want to say about Connect Tarpon Springs, and I don't want to insult some of the comments that are put there because I appreciate all residents' comments, but if you read any of the Connect Tarpon Springs, and you know this as well as I, any place that you ask for the opinions you'll get, uh, I'd like an Aldi's, a Starbucks, a Wawa, a hotel, Trader Joe's, um, on a lot of the things. It's not on this particular one, but you'll get a cross-section without getting a good, strong idea of what really needs to be done. I think you need to ask, not on Connect Tarpon, but the people that was said earlier that live there, that work there, that w walk there, that ride their bicycles there, that um, get their opinion of what that uh, uh, Greek community should look like. Um, the other thing is, they have here, this is what also has taken place as stock, uh, stakeholder interviews ongoing. I don't, I don't see that. 
Um, so number three, how do you have uh, data gathering and existing condition analysis if those two projects were not really followed through, you know, with any facts? So uh, I'll let you say what you want. Go ahead. Well, okay. First, the project's ongoing. They're not done. So yes, they're reviewing all of our existing codes and ordinances to see how, to the mayor's point, how do we mesh these things together? We've got existing historic districts. We have overlap between them with the cultural district. So yes, it was to look at all. So all that's ongoing. Um, the surveys are out. We've been, you know, we've done two different surveys on Connect Tarpon. They are interviewing stakeholders. I don't have the stakeholder list for you. We can provide that. We can expand that if necessary. Um, we are our, our next big community engagement will be on October. Right, 18th, right here at 6 o'clock p.m. We will be pushing that out to the, the area through all social media. We'll do mailed notice to property owners, residents, um, and we're asking that you know, we'll be doing um, some placemaking exercises. We'll be doing a poll everywhere to try to get in, direct input on what types of design guidelines or conservation districts. That's all part of, that's all being developed right now what would take place during that community engagement process. So I think, I mean, what I would like is to let this play, you know, let us get through the community engagement on October 18th and then come back to the board with, and, and see, see where we are. We can maybe even present some interim findings, you know, from the consultants. Um, if we need to ask for some additional money, I think we can do it at that point in time. But I, I would like to continue to let this move forward I you know I hear you about the the stakeholder input we, perhaps we need to broaden that out we'll look at that um, if the board wants to provide similar to you know if you want to provide direction to some additional stakeholders we we'll welcome that um, I, that's that's where I am right now I'm you know I'm, I want I want a good product out of the end of this I certainly don't want you know a disenfranchised group of people out there they're going to say hey we didn't really get our due so we clearly something's amiss and we we need to fix it okay um commissioner kuyas <clears throat> from all this what what i what i'm getting is yeah there doesn't seem to be that much work done over the last six months or communication between stakeholders and us board members but we can fix that we can fix it. And so I think I think the best approach to this is let's have a, a workshop, a, a town hall meeting. Let's make the 18th a town hall meeting. We're all here. We give the opportunity for all these residents and, and business owners and property owners to come speak their mind. You know, uh, it's, I think, one of the most, you know, best ways to hold everyone accountable and just get us all here to, to get this input that uh, we, we seem to not get as much as we desire. And let's make it two meetings. Let's do what it takes to try to get this input to help staff, help this consultant, and uh, create a vision. Because, you know, this conservation overlay historic district, uh, the sponge docks is best when it has a little bit of everything. And I'd like to be able to see designs for, for many different aspects. I mean, there's a lot to consider right now. You know, I, I'd like to see designs where there's bollards out in the street on the weekends sometimes when, when the roads are closed. What's the layout of the sponge dock's gonna look if the residents vote to purchase the property? A lot of things shift. And we all know that as, as board members and I, I hope the residents and property owners out here understand that too. You know, that that Santorini lot gets purchased by the city. There's a lot of different ways for land use and, and possible changes to the sponge docks that I, I hope the residents are aware of and other property owners down there. So um, there's really a lot to consider. Uh, when the sponge docks was going doing great in the 90s and maybe early 2000s, you had a nightlife down there. You had. Athens Street was full, whether it was Zorba's being open till 2 a.m., which some residents don't like that right now when there's noise, but at some point that's gonna come back. 
there was a casino boat that would come in and take people to and from the boat offshore three, four times. That's good for the community. People come here to spend money, they're gonna go eat at the restaurants and then they're gonna go on the casino boat and, and go out to the, main, to the main one. We need to bring that type of stuff back. And I don't know how that affects conservation or the historical layout, but you know, there may need to be some rooftop bars out there. And, and you know, some people's uh, ideas within the Greek Town Heritage Pres Preservation Organization may, di may be different from others inside of it. And so uh, the sponge docks needs to be incorporated all one way or another. That's when it thrives the best and, and making sure we don't lose the historical perspective and, and the culture of the sponge docks is of the utmost importance. But uh, you know, there's some things to consider. What, what, what is, what's Santec gonna come up with the design if the properties are purchased like we discussed? So there's many different layouts. You, you know how land use works, one per, one property gets changed and instantly changes the outlook of a whole neighborhood, you know? And so when it comes to like residential buildings and designs, you know, I'm back and forth with it because I don't like how the fruit bowl area, you can't upgrade your roof to, some, to a better quality, you know, if you're able to. But I also don't like seeing a house recently built you know, off in the sponge docks that looks nothing like its neighboring houses in a very modern, contemporary way. So um, I don't want too much restriction, but I I'm hoping the building, of the, you know, the, the, this building codes and stuff is meant to keep the designs of the buildings the same. And when they do upgrades and stuff, not to penalize them to stick to a lesser product. And so, I really challenge this board. Let's have our workshops. Let's have everyone here. We'll have our, sorry, sorry, Miss Irene, our city clerk here, take, you know, recording everything. Let's have the people. Let's give it two, three rounds, whatever it's going to take. It's still not, we're not far off to fix this. And there's a lot of people in the sponge docks or even in Tarpon Springs or property owners that have different visions of what the sponge docks should incorporate with all these characteristics and districts within it that it can be. So that's just where I'm at right now with it. And we got a long ways to go, but let's, I think the focus of this is to create some community involvement with the stakeholders. And I think we need to be accountable and be here for that. And we need to create a special meeting for it. That way we don't go back to planning and say, hey, you're not getting it done or go back to the residents or the stakeholders say, hey, where were you? You know, let's, let's try to do it that way. And I think that's the most effective approach. Thank you. Commissioner Kuliganis. Yeah, this is a special area for all of us, but some of us even more so. I mean, my, my grandfather, my father was born in Greektown in 1915. My mother-in-law still lives on Athens Street, and she worked with Mary Toth for 35, 40 years at the bank. Um, and right next door to her home on Athens Street, is an example of the, uh, the lack of planning that can happen. Um, there was a beautiful estate home there. Uh, you remember the home, and I think every, anybody who was around uh, years ago remember that home that was there that was tore down and some modern looking condominiums went in uh, that don't necessarily fit the dock area at all. Um, even more, even s sadder than that house being torn down was the tree in the front yard of that property in front of that home that I think if five of us got together and put our arms and held hands, we couldn't go around the trunk of that tree. Um, and it was ripped out to build those condominiums. So we know we need to protect that area and we need to do whatever it takes. Um, I agree with Commissioner Kulias. I think we need some workshops and like town hall. I think that should be in, in two parts. I think we should have a residential town hall and then we should have the commercial 
sponge docs town hall because I think they're very different. Um, it's going to be challenging because when you really look around, you don't see a specific kind of architecture. There's a lot of different types of architecture that, uh, especially on the sponge docks, it's very eclectic. Um, so trying to figure that out is going to be a big challenge for you and your, your crew. But, um, but I definitely think we should have the, the meetings we need to be, we need, if, if we can't get it from this group, then we need to do it ourselves and have those workshop meetings and get the input and then eventually get as soon as we can to some ordinances with teeth to protect that area from any future devastation. And like Commissioner Kouliot said, homes being built there that don't fit at all, uh, that's gotta stop. So anyways, I'm, I, I would definitely agree to move forward like you say, um, but again, with the involvement, if, if it takes these uh, two workshops, then it's, it's worthwhile. I can't imagine anything we're doing that's more important. I, um, okay, that's the commission comments. The only, uh, the purpose of this item was to provide direction. Yes. Um, I, 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 one thing for sure, I wanna make sure everybody understands, I've still got all the confidence in Ms. Vincent to do her job. I don't think it's appropriate for whatever town hall meeting, workshop, for the commission to be there to, I don't wanna say interfere, but the idea is for some face time between Ms. Vincent's staff, the consultants, and the residents. And um, I think they need to get their work done. So I, I want a consensus. Is there any interest from a majority consensus of to have a, um, a workshop or a town hall meeting or allow Ms. Vincent to continue as she's asked us to do? Is there any interest in a, in a you know, should no. we continue on as, as planned? My opinion is as soon as we get a town hall with all five of us in there, it becomes formal. Yeah. And there's no conversation, there's diatribe. And that's what happens. And I think in this particular case, especially since we're dealing with residents and business owners that have, you know, lifelong and, and generation long stakeholders within this area, there needs to be a conversation, not a, not a he speaks, she speaks, they, you know, sort of thing. You don't really, there's no compromise when you do that. You okay. can't exchange ideas, you just present ideas. And it's, it's too formal. That's my, my personal opinion, anyway. Um, Commissioner Eisner, how do you, thank you, Vice Mayor Lund, how do you feel about that? S same thing, I, um, I think there should be the workshop. Um, I don't think we should be present at the workshop. Most workshops we're not present at. Um, we are the decision makers when we get the feedback. So that's my comment on that. Uh, allow Ms. Vincent to continue on as she has. Okay. So I, I think that's. You know, I, I just, I think you guys are missing the point. The point is these residents don't get involved unless we're all here. We can, they can have the workshops all they want, but you're not going to see the same amount of residents out here. The minute we get involved in it, we don't have to be nitpicky. We can just sit back and actually let the conversation happen. But that's what we are. We help enable these individuals that come here and speak their mind. And I think if we're here, we're not, we obviously need one more step in. We need two engagements. I don't think one's enough. And frankly, I don't wanna hear uh, another reason that there's not all the stakeholders are being reached or the, the communication. I want us to be able to be present to give the confidence for these residents to come and speak and make this as interactive from the residents as possible. And we can refrain from speaking. I mean, we, we have that right, you know. So uh, that was my point, that the residents tend to show up in, in, in bigger uh, efforts when we're all here, when we can get people to get their ideas out. And hey, like I said, there might, there might be a mix of different opinions within one organization. I'd like to hear it out here. I, let me just say, um, I don't even know what your plan is for the engagement meeting that you're talking about on October 18th. Um, there's absolutely no reason why commissioners can't be present, not here, mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. And I'm not sure whether you're gonna have that polling system like we did before. Well, 
which I think is outstanding. We will. And, well, it'll, and be a, it'll be available for people that want, we're having it televised as well. So Having cell phones yes. to be able to yes. state their preference. So I think there's a lot of enticement to cause people here. And I think um, the Greek, the Tarpon Springs Greek Town uh, Cultural Historic Association is going to get their job to get, do their job to get people here and, and get that information out as well. So again, I've got, um, I've, we, we've had that experience <clears throat> with Distan and some other things that, uh, um, I forgot the consultant, but they brought it in for us and, and I think that worked out well. So I'd like to continue giving Mrs. Uh, mm -hmm. um, Vincent an opportunity to do what she needs to do. Uh, so. and, uh, uh, Commissioner Coleos, we will be, um, we had already intended to include the potential properties that the city may purchase if the referendum goes through as part of um, as part of the workshop so we wanted to get in you know feedback on what's the what's the possibilities what would people like to see things of that nature so we, we're already planning to include that no, thank you and, and I truly believe that you know the district needs a lot of different options it needs the pure conservation option it needs the option where it's a hybrid district you know Bars, there's a little bit more of a nightlife. There's more economic-based stuff. There's, you know, so it's I, I, it's got to be a balance. And I just don't want a few individuals to be able to take it. And and we need to have all options out there. And I do think we need to be involved until we can get them to have all the information possible, absorb it all, and then take it where they need to. I, I believe part of the message tonight was for uh, the staff to present us progress reports more often and I think that would accommodate and and then we would see how things are going and if if there's something else that we need to do that we can do it at that time but I, do you agree with yes, that? Yes I agree. Okay. Yeah, I just don't want to see the list of stakeholders but outside of that I agree with Commissioner <laughs> Cruz about having multiple stakeholder events but I think we should be in the audience we shouldn't be up here directing everything because I think that over formalizes for way past my consideration of a town hall. I, I want the people to have discussions, not, can, not statements. Can, can yeah. I, can we make it mandatory that we attend? I mean, I, I want people I, to get I, involved. I, I plan on being here October. I'm going to be there. So, okay. I mean, I mean mandatory means that no. if, if the, you know, if it's up to the individual, I don't think we can <laughs> make it mandatory unless we have a commission meeting, but yes. um, I, yes. I think we're, that we're mandatory audience. I don't yeah. need, need to say anything more about that. I think commissioners should be here and that's up to them as to whether they want to or not. Um, if there's no further comments, I'd like to continue on with our agenda. We need to move on to the ordinances and resolutions. Um, we're late in doing that. Uh, so um, thank you, Ms. Vincent. Wherever you are, there you are. Okay. Um, Can I ask for a five minute? Uh, you want a break? Okay. It's 817. Let's reconvene at 827. <laughs> Pardon me?
Is he going to go farther? Okay. There he is. Okay. Got everybody okay. I reconvene the meeting at 829 p.m. Um, we're going to ordinances and resolutions. I've been asked, um, since we have a number of people here that would like to speak on number 18, ordinance 2023-22, water and sewer rates, uh, to have that first, unless the commission, any commissioner has an objection, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Um, City Manager, of course. It's item 18. This is the water and sewer rates first read. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Kardash, if you can read yeah. the, uh, ordinance by title first, then we'll go to the uh, staff report. Since you're taking it out of order, um, can you give me the ordinance number again? It's ordinance 2023-22, water and sewer rates. Gina, that was the very last one. Okay, okay. got it. Thank you. Yes, All right. Uh, ordinance number 2023-22, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending portions of Chapter 20 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Tarpon Springs, increasing the water rates for fiscal year 2024, December 1st, 2023 through September 30th, 2024, and fiscal year 25, October 1st, 2024, through September 30th, 2025, increasing the sewer rates for fiscal year 2024, <clears throat> December 1st, 2023, through September 30th, 2024, um, increasing the reclaimed water rates and for fiscal year 2024, December 1st, 2023, says through September 30th, 2024, and fiscal year 25, October 1st, 2024 through September 30th, 2025, and providing for an effective date. This is uh, first reading. Second reading will be held on November 7th, 2023, uh, and will be published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only on October 18th, 2023. Um, this is a change from the original published um, second reading that was for October 17th. Mayor? Okay, thank you, Ms. Kardash. Uh, City Manager, of course. Yes, Paul Smith, will you give the presentation, please? Thank you. Uh, good evening, Paul Smith, Public Services Director. With me here tonight are members of the team that worked on this rate evaluation and the recommendations. Um, with us here tonight are Andrew Burnham from Stantec, the rate consultant, Ron Herring, our Finance Director, and Thomas Kiger, the Public Services Assistant Director. And Mr. Kiger will be giving the presentation. I wanted to mention that Ordinance 2023-22, it presents a revised two-year rate plan that was based on updated financial analysis. And um, as Attorney Kardash mentioned, to ensure enough time for advertisement of the ordinance, we're deferring the second reading to November 7th and um, the proposed effective date from November 1st to December 1st to give enough time for all of that to be discussed and um, voted on. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Kiger. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thomas Kiger. I'm the Assistant Director for Public Services and I was also the city's project manager for this rate study. Today, uh, we're gonna do a quick recap of the presentation for the benefit of the members of the public uh, from our previous rate study presentation from August 8th. Uh, we had a little bit of feedback from the community, so we wanted to reiterate some of the key points from the, the rate study. 
Uh, a key point that we did want to uh, really focus on is that the purpose of this rate study is to examine the financial health and make do long-term planning for the Water and Sewer Enterprise Fund. And it's important for uh, the public to be aware that the Water and Sewer Enterprise Fund is a fund that is wholly funded by user fees and is not uh, commingled with uh, city ad valorem tax revenues uh, or other sources of revenue. So it, it's the sole source of funding for the w operations of the uh, water and sewer utility and for all capital improvements for the water and sewer utility, excluding grants and other sorts of outside funding. Uh, as we mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, uh, operational cost inflation has been a very key challenge the utility's been dealing with. Uh, the cost of inflation uh, for, uh, for products associated with the uh, water, operation of a water and sewer utility has actually dramatically outpaced general inflation. And here you can see we have four key items that we brought as examples to identify uh, some of the examples of the things that we've been uh, having to address increased costs. So electricity, things like chemicals for water and wastewater treatment, uh, lab supplies, uh, parts, pumps, motors, pipes, uh, and even insurance for the facilities have all increased dramatically over the last several years since the previous rate study. Uh, and just these four items alone have increased almost uh, $1.5 million annually uh, since our last rate study was conducted. <coughs> uh, here's a couple of quick examples of items that we've uh, seen inflation in. You can see on the left, you have the Federal Reserve's Index for Water Treatment Chemicals. Uh, and on the right, you can see the index for the, uh, the National Commodity Index for Plastic Pipe, also from the Federal Reserves. Uh, these are fairly <coughs> indicative of the types of cost inflation we've seen in the utility, uh, sometimes 30%, uh, in some cases, depending on the commodities, up to uh, over 100% cost inflation since the last rate study. Uh, similarly, we've experienced significant cost increases in construction. Um, we have some major capital needs coming up in the last, in the next uh, 10 years and beyond. And uh, you can see here, this is the Federal Reserve uh, uh, Construction Commodity Index. Uh, you can see dramatic inflation in the construction sector uh, since May 2021. Uh, over the last three years, that's gone up 30 to 40 percent, and we continue to have you know major needs to invest in our in our city infrastructure. The city has also taken uh, significant steps to try and manage uh, our water rates, to uh, control water rates for the benefit of our residences and to our residents, and to keep costs down to the maximum degree possible. <coughs> the three areas we've been heavily focused on have been cost cuts. Uh, for example, we were able to eliminate a uh, to work with DEP to eliminate the need for a five million dollar uh, injection well project that was the result of emerging regulations from the state of Florida. Uh, we were able to do that, and that was a big savings to the, uh, the community and also to our uh, Water and Sewer Enterprise Fund. We've also been focused heavily on revenue recovery, uh, trying to make sure that we're keeping up with our cash register and the meters and uh, making sure that, uh, you know, all, everyone who's paying for our services is paying for exactly what they pay for and nothing more. And we've also heavily utilized alternative funding uh, in our rate plan. Uh, we are assuming half a million dollars annually in grants in the future. Uh, we've also uh, utilized our reserves and our impact fees proposed in the rate plan to the maximum extent possible as sort of a bridge to help us buy time uh, to uh, allow our revenues to uh, get back in line with our uh, expenses. Uh, we've had some major adjustments in the capital program. Uh, as you can see on the left, we have the 2024 capital program as originally planned, and those were largely based on early uh, 2020s uh, capital dollars. Uh, and part of, uh, through this study, we identified that we were gonna need to defer some major projects, so we've actually cut the capital budget for 2024 to only $2.7 million, so that's about half. Uh, eventually, some, many of these projects will need to be completed, uh, including building out those cities, uh, reverse osmosis water plants well field, major 40 and 50 year rehabs for the wastewater facility, which was built in 1985 and continued investment in the city's water pipes. Um, so eventually we do need to restore the adequate funding levels to support those capital programs. Uh, as you can see here, we're not the only utility that's dealing with uh, significant levels of inflation in our operational costs and have had to adjust accordingly. Uh, this is a quick survey of regional utilities. Uh, some of these are, are similar size and some of them are a little bigger, but it gives you a range of what other utilities are experiencing and how they're responding. The average three-year uh, utility rate increase, uh, just additive, 
is about 14% over, over the last three years, and that's uh, last year through uh, next year. Um, so other utilities are also having to respond in this way. One key piece of information that we did want to express to the public is that our current rate plan as it stands is not feasible. Uh, we did a lot of work to see if we could find a way to make the current rate plan work. And at the end of the day, we're working on an operational deficit. We're producing a commodity in water and we're providing services. <coughs> and we're selling those services to the community at a rate that's uh, lower than what it costs to provide. So until we address that operational deficit, we're going to continue to spend money out of reserves. And eventually, that would result, result in our reserves being depleted. So that's the primary driving factor as to why we're recommending the rate increase today. Uh, we'll also require some additional borrowing, which is uh, required to help stabilize the fund for our capital needs. So as we proposed back in August, uh, we we're recommending a one-year inflationary catch-up. Uh, there are currently two years of uh, rate adoption on the ordinance today. There, will be a, there would be a 9.9% one-time increase to address uh, this acute inflation that the utility has experienced, followed by a 3.75% uh, increase next year that we're hoping will be more indicative of uh, future long-term inflationary adjustments. And here's a quick comparison of where the current plan is compared to our previous plan adopted in 2019. You can see the 2019 plan uh, was relatively steady increases. We adopted a reduction and a uh, rate freeze in 2021 for 2022 through 2024. And the green plan is what we're trying to get back to. So. Uh, we're going to propose a one-time increase of 9.9% next year, uh, well, this fiscal year now, and um, an additional smaller 3.75% increase, which will ultimately bring us right about back to where we were uh, scheduled to be at in 2025, and it will actually be a little bit more affordable than the original plan was for the average consumer in 2024. <clears throat> uh, as you can see here, knowing that we had a year last year of rate freeze, our total three-year increase is less than the area average of 14.2%. So we are uh, in the ballpark of what's, uh, what works other utilities are proposing in the region. And similarly, we know that folks like to compare their utility bills, and we continue to be roughly where we are uh, with the proposed rate increase by 2025. Uh, we're in with our peer utilities of Safety Harbor and Clearwater and Dunedin and Oldsmar that also operate their own uh, water and wastewater um, treatment facilities and have similar source water to us. And also, we're, uh, our next closest peer is also uh, Pinellas County, which is a much larger utility, but uh, a lot of folks are right down the road in Pinellas County service area. We also wanted to express to the board and to the members of the community that we did get some feedback, and we also did a little bit of outreach ourselves. We tried to reach out to, uh, particularly to any of our citizens that uh, have had interest in this item in the past. Uh, there were sort of four key uh, types of feedback that we got. The most common was actually just informational. A lot of folks wanted to know what was driving this cost increase, what we were experiencing, and we talked to them um, and tried to provide them as much information as we could. Uh, the second key theme was that the, the public seemed to strongly prefer steady rate increases over time. Uh, staff also tends to prefer that, but in this case, we have to have an acute uh, solution to an acute problem with this uh, rapid inflation that we've experienced over the last couple of years. But long term, we're hoping to get back to more steady increases as been the historic trend uh, for the city, and we'll be considering that in future rate studies. Uh, lastly, uh, we did have several customers that offered that this is kind of typical. They weren't really surprised. Uh, we thought that was valuable feedback as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but the cost of everything is going up. We're experiencing it as a utility uh, from our electric providers. So a lot of folks did kind of offer the feedback that, well, this is kind of typical. This is kind of what we expect nowadays. Uh, and also some other folks felt that conservation was actually really important for them to help keep their bills down. And lastly, the one other uh, key piece of feedback that we got was uh, there were several uh, customers that uh, felt that our presentation that focused on our average water use was not necessarily representative of um, typical water use for a residence. So we did go back and verify those numbers. We did find that 4,500 gallons per month is actually slightly higher than the statistical average for uh, year-round uh, water use for a single-family home in our service area. Uh, we're required to report those numbers to the Water Management District on an annual basis, so we have those readily available. 
And uh, we did also want to provide a quick comparison for the public for what this rate increase might look like for a, uh, a lower volume water user or a slightly higher volume water user. So um, the low volume, volume, uh, low volume user we estimated as being about 2,200 gallons a month, which would be about half of the average residents. And so their monthly bill for water and sewer service would be about $70, and they would experience about a little less than a $7 increase uh, with, uh, in the first year. And the uh, second example we want to provide was a higher volume water user, so 9,000 gallons, which is about double the average. And um, their monthly bill would increase uh, by about $16, which uh, makes a little bit of sense because the average bill is going up eight, so they're using twice as much water, so their, their bill is going up a little bit more than double what someone who's using the typical amount would. Uh, we also wanted the public to be aware that, that we do have uh, quite a few resources to support folks who might be struggling with water bills. Uh, we maintain a lifeline rate of very affordable rates. The cheapest water you buy is the first 5,000 gallons that's essential for public health, uh, for hygiene, and for drinking, for those essential uses in the home. Uh, we also have uh, resources that we provide. Uh, we can provide contact information. We maintain a long-running list of outside community resources that help with utility billing assistance, including local nonprofits. Uh, and we also have provided extensive support for conservation. We also offer irrigation meters and a variety of other mechanisms to help people reduce their water use or lower their bill uh, or find ways to uh, keep their water use down to help uh, save money. And we wanted folks to be aware that those are available. And if anyone has any questions or would like to access those, that they can reach out to the city and we'll put them in, we'll, we can provide information. So in summary, um, we've uh, provided the results back in August of the rate study. Uh, we've notified the public via the uh, public notification process through the billing system of the uh, rate hearings per state requirements. Uh, this is the first reading of the ordinance. The second reading will be uh, the first meeting in November. And if approved, these rates will take effect on December 1st, 2023. And then subsequently, staff are going to continue to work on our capital program and report back uh, to the board in uh, 2024. Okay. Uh, is there anyone else that's going to speak? Uh, Mr. Smith, is there anybody else? Okay. Um, let me go to public comments. Are there public comments here this evening? My name is Harry Woodmansey. I'm from 1259 Windy Bay Shoal. Uh, I moved here about uh, two and a half years ago. I lived in Hillsboro for uh, about 15 years. Retired from the military in Pig Tarpon. And uh, absolutely love it, gotta tell you. Everything's been great, except for the water. Um, I water my grass in Hillsboro about three times a week. My average bill, looking at, I'm looking at all your charts, my average bill there was about $147. Right now, my, uh, my first water bill after watering, $400. My highest bill so far has been $677. I uh, stopped watering my grass. I live with my wife. Our average water bill for the last five months has been $364. So if you look at that, I'm like, OK. So $148.59 is water. Sewage is $142.48. I mean, and you're saying it's a significant because unprecedented, unprecedented operational cost. Well, I'm saying it's unprecedented for me right now for the cost that I'm paying. Because I use like simple math and I'm like, okay, if my average bill is $364, you increase that by 9.9%. And now in November, that'll go to $400. Then you add the 3.7, yeah, 3.75. So you get back to your almost your 14%. I'm at $450 a month. I use the term unsustainable. That's unsustainable. You know, uh, I look at it and I'm like, you, you got to understand, hey, that's the uh, great charts. I'm in the military. I love PowerPoint. But hey, that, you can use charts all you want. I'm telling you, I looked at Newport Ritchie. I got a buddy down there. Not anywhere close to this. Not close. Still, even with the increase that Hillsborough's got, not close. 
So I don't know if it's from my water meter, what's going on. It's me and my wife. I stopped watering my grass, and I'm that high. Uh, so I look at it and I go like, if you want to get someone motivated, and I know our voter turnout's been low, but this right here, this is a motivation right now, because I looked at it and I was like, holy moly, I got to get up at 4.30 in the morning, and thank you very much for bringing this up earlier. Uh, I got to get up at 4.30 in the morning head, and head out, but it's that important. I mean, that's a car payment. When you put all that together, the increase, and you times it by 12, $5,400 annually increase and you're talking about the operational cost I think all of us got an operational cost it's called insurance it's called gas it's called in I mean it goes across the board so I, I think that your stuff that hey we can tighten it up get something else there's got to be something else because hey you're tapping out uh, I believe not just me but everybody out there that's listening to me right now, uh, you, I, you got my attention. You got my full attention right now. Thank you. I, I was going to ask you, sir, did, has anybody come out to look at your water usage and kind of give you some information on it? Uh, so when I got the $677 bill, I about lost my mind and said, and they came out and they're like, put a blue sticky and said, yeah, it's good. That was it. And so every month, every month it's been, four hundred dollars and then it'll drop down but it's my wife and myself no watering no watering grass and so i have no idea what's going on but that if if that's an average for me and across the board hey you're you're killing us absolutely killing us well, we can provide you some analysis i just checked with the city manager and mr smith can you follow up with this gentleman as well okay I, i'd appreciate it yes sir. thank you Mayor. thank you is there any other comments uh, on this matter? Um, Greg, Greg Barnes, uh, 1281 Windy Bay Show. I live in the same community. A few years ago, I worked with Mr. Smith. Um, I got the irrigation meter. I tried to reduce my costs. I reduced my, I do water the grass not very often, not like I used to. For the last, since January, my, in, my, my bill averages just 296, I think it was, is what my bill averages since January. Um, after this increase, it'll probably it'll go to like 325, probably. I just want you to know what we're dealing with, what our costs are actual, because we're actually paying a higher cost. The charts kind of make it look like yeah, eight dollars. It's it's more than eight dollars. It's and it's like eight dollars on top of what a, a huge amount that we're already paying. So I just. Just want you all to know what we're actually dealing with every month in the water bill. So, and I did have a question. Um, you said it's user fees that pay for 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 the water plant or the water. Is 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 that by law? Is that can that be addressed another way? Because I know. I understand the city wants to pay a million dollars or something for some land down by the sponge docks eventually. I think we need to take care of our, our yeah, Mr. Smith you you can go ahead and answer that if you'd like or address it I'll just say it's an enterprise fund um, as far as the legal reasons behind it I know that that's historically been how water and sewer is funded and I think the vast majority of local governments operating under the same principles I don't know if I can add anything else about changing it okay but yeah but just to let you all know so you're aware we, we've done everything we can't have wells in, in our community a lot of people are concerned about wells anyway because of the, the Superfund site being so close to that, and we don't know what the well water is actually like anyway. And we don't have reclaim, we don't have access to reclaim water. So those are some of the limitations that we're under, just so you all are aware. But thank you. Thank you for Would you us. like for, since you're in the same community, would you like for the staff to check your water usage as well and provide you some insight as far as how it's being used and so forth? No, it's not. I, I, okay. I read the meter almost daily. I know, I know. I know exactly what's going okay. on. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Um, are there any other public comments? Um, <coughs> they didn't made it back in time. I had to go feed my dogs. Peter Delac is 514 Ashland Avenue. Uh, 
I looked at the stuff and was still listening and uh, Nicholas mentioned something about the importance of impact fees, which will be relevant on another item. But if you go back, can you put this graph up? All right, so go back to 2021. And you see that straight line that is from the 2019 plan. And if you look at the new plan, the dotted line, it's basically to catch up to that previous plan. So then you have to wonder, why was the other plan changed? That was a continual, steady, easy incline as compared to the jump that scares people now. I would say, what was going on during those times? Elections? People like to pontificate about lowering your rates and lowering your fees. It's a good play at one point, but then you guys end up having to bite the bullet for it. <sighs> now, something else I would like to clarify, the gentleman I heard earlier who said, his water bill's 400 to 600, you definitely need to find some way to reduce your water use. But there's other things also involved that um, can be looked at. <clears throat> when we have projects come to town and want to develop, quit letting them off the hook for hooking up to city water and sewer. Ron is here. He can tell you it's in the bond covenants. When you annex, you need to expand your sewer base if, and your water base. If you don't expand it, then the people that are left on the current water base or the current customers keep absorbing the cost. So one, you got to quit letting the developers off the hook when they come in and they want to use county water or county sewer. Make them hook up to the city. Yep, maybe 250 yards, 500 yards, I don't know. But that's the requirement, and it satisfies one of the things that was mentioned about your bonds. Secondly, what about the bonds? Maybe Ron can clarify this. I'm a little vague on it, but what the time frame is on that. And there's restrictions about what you can do with your water. You cannot retail sell it, from my understanding, and Paul can maybe clarify that or, but to my understanding you can't, but when the bonds are done paid for and you're not tied to any requirements of Swift Mud, Tarpon Springs water. Zephyr Hills pumps it out, Nestle sucks it out of the, out of the ground that half a, half a, half a mil, a, a, a quarter or a gallon. Revenue sources, look at other ways to have revenue sources. And lastly, for those who complain about the water bill, let's really call it what it is. It's a utility bill. There's the water, for some people, the sewer, also storm water, also garbage. All of those have gone up. So let's not try to lump the whole thing into just what's necessary to keep tarpon, rated properly for their water process because we've already won awards for it. And lastly, electric costs, more solar panels right there across the way on the, on the Stauffer property. Okay. Are there any other public comments of anyone here? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? Please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do have a raise hand. I'll allow the first person in. Okay. Hi, um, this is Sharon Mizell and my husband, Gary Mizell. We live at 1818 Bryland Street, the code 34689. Uh, we're listening to what, you know, the other citizens are saying 
And while I feel that you act as though some of these are unusual, these bills are not unusual at all. I will tell you that many of our neighbors um, are looking at utility bills that are over $300. We have reclaimed water, uh, which has helped us out a lot. And I also see that you're looking to raise that as well. So it appears to me that someone, and I understand it was not necessarily this uh, board of commissioners, but again, someone in the city did not do their homework a few years ago. They did, I've been in planning my whole life and nobody looked and projected the increases in the projects that needed to be done. So now that burden is being passed on to the consumer. We are senior citizens. We're looking at a cost of living increase of 3.2% for 2022. You've already raised the um, refuge and recycling rate 3.5% this year. So now you're looking at another 9.9% increase. I don't know where the consumer is getting this money. And then, right, and then the 3.75 for the next nine years, which is more than a 44% increase over the next 10 years. I mean, it's just not feasible. Yes, you have programs. Not everybody qualifies for those programs. I mean, those programs are based on poverty levels for the most part. But just your average consumer trying to get by cannot afford to make a 10% increase. And then it's state more than And then you're not even talking the taxes and everything else on top of that. It's just not feasible for the consumer. You anything else? So I really, um, and I agree with the gentleman that said we should look at some of the other projects the, the city is spending money on. Land. Land. $1.8 million to buy land with no solid plan for development at this point by the city. Help out people with their utility bills and make this a more realistic cost. It, we should not be punished for the fact that someone did not anticipate these increases. Yes, everything's going up, but that's part of the job of the commission and the people on these committees to anticipate that there will be increases. And you can't just go, oh, we didn't raise anything for the last three years. Now you have to pay. That's your mistake, not ours. And it's not fair to pass that on to the consumer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Jumper, are there any other comments? And we do not have any other raised hands at this time. Okay, Ms. Jacobs, did we have some? Yes, we do have a couple. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first one was from Sharon and Gary Mizell, but since they just spoke, I will not be reading it. Okay. Uh, the next one is from Patricia Orr, 787 Salt Lake Drive. The proposed increase of 9.9% to the water rate couldn't come at a worse time. All people are experiencing increases to all utilities, including electricity, gas, and also groceries and gasoline. This is especially true for senior citizens like me living on a fixed income. Water in Florida and especially Tarpon Springs is already at an unsustainable level. I implore you to reconsider such a rate hike at this time. And the last one is from Wayne Kidd, 734 Arthur's Court. A 9.9 .9 rate increase is rather large with a 30 day notice to then be followed with another 3.75 next year for a questionable water quality. In my opinion, I have worked with reclaim water for many years. Personally, I must purchase all water that I ingest just to feel safe. Pumping water from just south of one of the most longest lasting Superfund contamination sites in US history. Just with that silt alone, the visual residue, I need to scrub toilets every five to six days, yet we are supposed to believe this water is safe to drink. Granted, I was not born here, but have lived here this fine, in this fine city for over 39 years many of those donating my time, labor, etc., to assist the youth of our city get a better start in life. As a disabled retired person, not seeing much of an ingress to income, this would eliminate my abilities to cover other rise in expenses. Thank you for your time, Wayne Hot Fries Kid. Thank you, Ms. Jacobs. Uh, from the look of a couple of people's faces, they may have been locked outside. Um, we're on public comments, so I want to make sure that you get an opportunity if you have any public comments on the water and sewer road rates do you yes. okay if you can come forward please no 
Not water and sewer. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to commission uh, discussion. Uh, Oh, okay. Doors aren't registered and locked. So. All right. Um, any commissioner, vice mayor, vice mayor Lund, I'm sorry. You know, I can really appreciate the fact that I'm a Tarpon Springs resident as well. My water bill is going up. My utility bills are going up. Um, the fact of the matter is that three years ago, somebody made a decision to lower rates. That was not a great decision. I'm not sure. I wasn't here on the commission at that particular time. It sounds like it was kind of a political decision um, rather than a sustainable business type decision, but that's really not for me to comment. The thing that I need to say is that we're in a situation where if we don't raise the water rates, we're going to be at a deficit. This is not an open-ended type of a situation where we can fund water and sewer from other enterprise accounts. That's just not the way it's done. So if we run out of reserve, run out with the ability to provide additional capacity or any capacity, then you're gonna run out of water, period. You're gonna be put on restrictions for using water. The only other thing I have to say as well as to is, I live in a household with two people. Our water bill is nowhere near $450 a month. I, ha I can't understand how much, how much gallonage that could be for two people. I, I just, I, I don't, cover, I mean, I've heard all sorts of things about how much your water bill is. I haven't heard anybody say, well, my water bill is just because I'm using 8,000 gallons a month or 5,000 or 6,000. So. For those people that, that seem to have an intense bill on their hands, I would really start taking a look at the way you're using water. Because it seems to me for two people to, to be up in the, in the four, five, or six plus gallons range is, is really high. That's all I've got to say. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Eisner. <clears throat> I can't really add anything to what Vice Mayor just said. I mean, I agree with it, it, this wasn't something that um, I liked or that we uh, were part of or did, but it's done. And <coughs> we're left with a situation of uh, bad choices. And the bad choice is, of course, to um, make the raise um, because we would lose our reserve, um, which we can't do. Um, I also would agree um, I have a very large home um, it's my wife and myself as well. Um, I have guests that come and utilize my water. I don't have a bill anywhere near that. So um, I'm not saying you don't have that kind of bill, but I would look into, I don't know, um, whether the, you know, the toilets are running or, I mean, anything, because it's a lot of, it's a lot of water um, consumption. So I don't know how to help you on that. Um, you know, my bill is extensive as also. My insurance has gone up also. Um, but I'm not anywhere near $400 um, or $600. Uh, so I, I don't know. And, and you've stopped watering your lawn. So I don't know how to help on this. I, I, I'm not in, happy that I have to vote on making an increase like this because you're not the only person. Many residents have called or sent me an email explaining their um, displeasure, but, uh, you know, I'm getting the same email that eggs have gone up and every supply that we use for construction and everything across the board is, is just out of, out of control and, you know, insurance companies are leaving. I mean, you know, it's, I don't know what else to do, um, but they can't be without money running, you know, the water supply that we have, so. I, I just don't know what to say on that. So, but I agree with what the vice mayor said. It was a situation we were tossed into. Um, I don't know what they were thinking with the uh, lowering of the rates or the keeping it at zero, um, but we can't. So, that's all. Uh, Commissioner Kulias. 
<clears throat> the we're gonna go back a little bit and because you know at times I, I I understand the residents frustrations when we come you know you come up here and say hey no one thought about this increase and why did we decrease it back in in 2021 but I was part of that decrease and I was a resident out there at the time and when we were coming up here and one of the most hostile political you know situations that were going on for about two years um, as, I as a private resident s made statements saying hey if we don't reduce the water rate we're gonna get rid of some people and find people who can now this board may come up here and say I wasn't part of it but majority of the members on this board were out in this audience they were paying attention to city politics they had the same backup material that anybody else could have had and so that 2.2 percent reduction was supposed to be a 3.75 increase that year in 2022 so it was almost we ended up not increasing the rate about five percent now we can always monday quarterback it but nobody saw the increase in construction costs and inflation i mean not even the greatest economists in this country saw some some of the inflation that we saw so we know it has to go up but i don't necessarily agree it has to go up to 9.9 percent this year um, i could see a pathway to get us to that original 2019 rate where we could do a, a flat seven percent this year and split up that other 2.9 percent and add it to years 25 and 26 because you know we can come up here and talk about i know what we spend in in our water and you know i know how much it costs you know but we don't know what some people's income is and we got to think about the people who really do live on a fixed budget all parts of town and so I think this board needs to consider about a 7% increase with that 2.9% split up for those other two years so the residents know there's gonna be a steady increase it'll help save some some costs but 9.9% is a lot and it may not seem much to some of us up here but we got 26,000 residents out there we got from single family, you know, some single parents. We got some senior citizens that live on, who knows what they live on, their fixed income. And we saw, we got capital improvement projects and, and that's frustrating to see pretty much half the budget cut, <clears throat> including these raises, these water weight, these water rate raises. So, uh, you know, how do we offset some of those costs? Well, maybe we do some less capital improvement projects relating to the water I, I i'm not sure but 9.9 percent .9 is a lot if our goal is to get to that original 2026 plan <clears throat> with that 2019 original plan i think we need to do the seven percent increase the first year and then do a 5.2 percent increase for 2025 and 2026 but I do want to make it clear. Yeah, I was very well aware of that rate reduction back in 2021. I was heavily involved as a resident over here. But when you're on this side and you realize percentages here and there comes at a cost and how many capital improvement projects you can do relating to that department you're in, you have to think twice. And that's really the difference in being in the different positions that we're in. So I would support a 7% increase this year but a 5.2 for 2025 and a 5.2 for 2026. And I don't know where this board wants to go, but I think it's a gradual increase the residents are aware of. And that 9.9% .9 is a lot to, like I mentioned, those who live on those fixed incomes, those single parents, so many different variables. So I don't know what a direction to go, but I'd like to see 
a different number than at 9.9 percent .9 this first year. Thank you. Commissioner Koulianos. Can you, uh, can you pull up that regional comparison with proposed plan? So I think this illustrates um, the fact that we didn't have any rate increases <coughs> in fiscal year 2023. Um, because only it looks like only Gulfport and Port Ritchie did not have rate increases in 2023, which is now forcing us um, to have to do all that catch up, right? I think that this this is clear. And I, again, we don't have a, if we had a time machine, we could go back and change what other boards did, but, and, and I'm not gonna try to pass any judgment on them. Uh, but that's kind of where we are right now. So I think this illustrates it. Um, when you look at the next slide, and you see that our average monthly bills, uh, where are you getting that from? Where, where are you getting that average monthly bill? Uh, these were compiled by uh, Stantac based on their survey of regional uh, water rates, and they apply our average 4,500 gallon a month use for a, a resident to the water rates from the surrounding utilities. So is the fact that if you look at the, again, the prior slide, we're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we're eighth in uh, rate increases over a three year period, but over here we are, um, you know, one, like the fifth highest, right, in, in rate. And why would you, could you explain why you think that is? Yes, the, um, we don't use anyone else's utility finance information to establish our rates. Our rates are solely established through a financial study of the, of the city of Tarpon Springs utility financial position. So uh, regardless of what Hillsborough County or Pinellas County are doing, uh, that's just informational to show that every utility is experiencing similar uh, inflationary pressures. Right. And what we do is we do a study where we have financial professionals look at the, uh, the amount of water we're selling, the services we're providing, project our costs, and look at our budgets, and uh, look at our 20-year capital plan, and um, establish rates that provide the revenue needed to support that. And in this case, we had to make some hard decisions and we had to defer a lot of capital and we found some ways to reduce our operational costs, including energy efficiency and things like that. And those are all reflected in the current rates, but that's how they're established is through a look at our financial position. You gave us at the, uh, the first, uh, when, when you presented this plan to us uh, prior, you gave us several options, right? You gave us the 9.9 .9 increase with the 375, and then you gave us, did you give us like a seven and a seven or something like along that line? Uh, earlier in the study, we did uh, look at um, uh, alternative <laughs> scenarios. We looked at right. quite a few scenarios actually. Yeah. And one of the last scenarios that we, we were considering is like a, as a potential option to see if we could make it work was uh, subsequent years of 7% increases. Okay. Uh, that that's, was not recommended uh, because it would have resulted in a much larger operational deficit or uh, uh, sh budget shortfall next year. So uh, next year we are forecast to miss our fund balance target, which is uh, required by city policy that we have to meet that. And uh, we're, we're expected to narrowly miss it based on the model, the financial model by probably a hundred to $200,000, uh, that would have resulted, uh, a 7% increase this year will likely result in us missing our financial target, which is our minimum fund revenue balance by over a half a million dollars most likely. So if we went, if we had a 2% uh, a drop in the first year, so divided by seven, so that's like a 28% so that would be about a 28% reduction in the nine, in, in what you have projected, right? And now you said it's, it's how much of an increase, an uh, $89 increase over, 
What was the increase, $8 a month? That was the other reason that we elected not to bring that forward because the 7% uh, increase really didn't result in a, a large measurable benefit to the residents. Yeah. So the average, under the proposed increase of 9.9, .9, the average resident's bill uh, will go up about $8. Okay. The 7% so, would only go up about, would go up a little over $6. So trying it's to make relatively I'm small. trying to make your point. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> if, if, so if, if you went from the 9.9 .9 down to the 7, uh, the way I calculate it is if it's $8 a month average increase, it's going to drop it down to about 6 Yes. So it's not a substantial drop, but it does jeopardize the uh, reliability, and it could put us in a, in a budget deficit, right? Yes, particularly in our environment right now. We're still getting costs coming in higher than... Right. Um, estimates. Um, this still continues to happen. So if, you know, I, I want to make it clear, staff, we spent months working on this, trying to bring this number down every which way. We don't want to bring this either. I mean, uh, I'm also a rate payer. So uh, the 9.9% .9 really represents the minimum amount that gives us a viable plan. And if we start working on trying to come in with lower numbers, you're just going to leave that um, fund more vulnerable to the unexpected, which I think we can continue to expect the unexpected in this environment. I don't see any letting up of that. But um, so really, that, that's what we're presenting to you. It's very tough. Yeah. I think Vice Mayor Lunt made some great points about how, how hard this is, also Commissioner Eisner. And I appreciate that and, and understand it. And. Um, so really, we've already done all these different alternatives, and each of them has some sort of Achilles heel to it that um, doesn't really make us in a good position, which has sort of brought us here tonight to begin with. Okay, well, thank you, and, and I, I agree. Every, everybody up here at this dais is also paying these rates as well, so it's not something we want, but I don't think it's... I don't think it's um, I think it's unavoidable. So, thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Uh, Mayor, may I ma make a comment about something that's been asked about? I, we can't open public comments up again. Um, I, I've I, got, let me just say what I need to say, and, and then I'll come back to you, Commissioner Eisner. Um, I was on the commission in 2020, and um, uh, the issues were different than material cost and operating cost and things. It was, but there was still a lot of hand wringing going on. And um, at that time, and Mr. Herring may, or Mr. Smith, you may know, we were doing rate studies, what, every three years or five years? Well, every two. We did one in 2018 and then came back in 2020 and, and now we're back again in 23. And, and then we had adjusted it after we made that drop to doing one every year or something like that and, and updating it. But this year we decided to do a full rate because of some of the issues that you all saw. Um, back then, if I remember correctly, some of the discussion had to do with interfund transfers. If you remember, Mr. Herring, it was, uh, you know, our interfund transfers, um, the amount of water the amount of money that we take out of the water account, for example, water and sewer accounts, that goes into the general fund that helps pay for the employees that support the water and sewer fund, bills, collections, and that sort of thing. Um, at that time, it was, it was um, under what was being, um, uh, what we were paying. And then Mr. Herring made an argument that you know, we, we should come up on that because of a variety of different factors. Um, that was something I, I questioned, but I think ultimately I wound up approving everything, uh, again, for the reasons that were presented at that time. And I think there was also, um, I had some issues with some of the assumptions that were done with the rate study the previous time, and I wanted some additional correction done, taking into account that make it, would make it more realistic at that particular time. So there's a lot of factors that went into the discussion back then. Um, I don't recall it was operating cost. I had more to do with other issues, but today we're facing operating cost. And I was it you that said a crystal ball. Somebody, one of the commissioners uh, said about if we had a crystal ball, 
um, we'd all, we probably wouldn't be sitting here. We'd be sitting on some Caribbean island or something like that with a lot of money in our pockets. But anyway, um, I don't like raising rates. Uh, I, I really don't. Uh, my wife and I can serve as much as we can. The one thing that I do want to offer residents is anyone that's got high water bills, really, if you're a family of two, three, and you've got the type of water bills that are in that category, a couple of hundred dollar water bills and that sort of thing, I really highly recommend that you contact our water department and ask them to come out and give you an analysis. Our water meters are very, very um, uh, sophisticated and the search that they can actually give you the time of day when you're your water consumption is and, and they also have enough experience to be able to ask you some of the questions based on what they see and maybe pinpoint that usage that you may not be aware. Um, it's getting to the point where I, I guess we all talk about, although not now, maybe a couple of years ago, the, the gallon of water was almost as expensive as a gallon of, of oil, but now we're back up to uh, oil costing more again. But um, I, I I, I think we are where we are. I think that um, if we don't do this in in three years, four years, another commission is going to be facing something probably significantly worse. And the same things will be said about the commission um, of tonight that are being said about the commission back in 2020. And I think that we have, uh, Stantec has been doing this rate study for us, I don't know how many years, but a very long time. And so they're very familiar with Tarpon Springs. And I don't think anyone's, um, and by law, we're not supposed to be making any profits. And, but as I said, there's, there's some issues that are, are complicated in all of this, but they were different in 2020 than they are now. So go ahead, Mr. Mayor, Smith. thank you. That was the point I wanted to make. I went back and watched that meeting from May 25th, 2021, and I wanted to remember what the what the facts were that the commission used to make their decision. And I will say there were a few points that I saw. The operating and maintenance escalation factor was coming in at 3.78% at that time versus the previous plan assumption of 4.39%. So in May of 2021, our expenses were significantly less than the, 20, the previous rate plan assumed. Also, we look at our spending rate. How much are we actually spending? What percentage of what we budget are we spending? Those numbers were coming in lower as well for both operations and capital projects. So based on all this, the recommendation of the study was the previous approved rate plan would provide an excess of what is required. So the commission's facing this decision. Do we collect more money than we need? Do we have an opportunity to freeze rates? So I think the decision was made based on the data provided. And, yeah. you know, I'm not here defending anybody or getting into politics. I'm just saying those were the facts at the time. Um, aside from a crystal ball, you make your best decisions on the data in front of you, and, and that's where we are. And similar to that, that's why we need to look at this on a regular basis, because right. look how much things have changed in two years. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, if, uh, Commissioner Eisner, I know you had your light on. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. I had uh, two questions. Does these, um, do you take into consideration the new project that you did with the um, solar? Would that re help reduce these electric costs first? That's the first question. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, um, we're factoring in the effects on our electric bills. Part of the problem is those bills are going up 15% here and there. I think all of us feel that pain. And um, so we have to project it'll be less than what it would have been, but we're still looking at, you know, a million dollars a year in electricity, even with that full built out system. Now it could be 1.2 million if you didn't have the solar panels. So. I mean, yes, the short answer is yes, that's taken into account and we'll keep looking for opportunities to make our own energy where we can. So the second thing is I want you to think back to the meeting we had, because I think I was the first commissioner to sit down with you guys. And uh, I don't think anybody on this board is happy about what we have to do, including yourselves. And my first comment back to you was I wanted an even incremental 
increase and I did not want to have a hard hit at all. And we discussed that. And I think I left there with that possibility that that's what we were going to do. But things changed because when you put the numbers together, you came back to me and said, it's just not going to work. It left us for too long a period being under our fund balance. I think we're allowed, and this would be a wrong question, maybe up to a year of being out of sync with what we need, but it brought us into multiple years of not meeting our fund requirements. So it became a, an infeasible plan. So back to, and, and the other point is, it's a minor point, but if you added those increases together, the residents would actually be paying more with that two-year version than the one-year version slightly more so i know the jump is an issue um there's a couple ways to look at that i mean one way to look at it we've avoided increasing on our ratepayers as long as possible and we've just really reached the point where we can no longer not do it so there has been a savings of sorts in these last few years by not having those increases but now we need to catch up so this is a final question. Um, I see that some of the um, jurisdictions had decent um, price increases like Tamper 8%, uh, Largo 5%, 6%. So I'm curious how Port Ritchie got away with a 1.3 or a Clearwater a 2.9, uh, Pasco County 2.9, uh, Pinellas County 2.2. Are you aware, are you able to, how did that happen? I'm going to ask Andy Burnham to come up just because his firm is the one that does all of these rate studies around. He might because, have some knowledge. Well, I asked that question because I'm sure they got the same electric rate increases as everybody else. So I'm just curious how they came out smelling more like a rose than we did. No, it's a, it's a very fair question. And I think a, a certain amount of this depends on timing. So the, the Port Ritchie example that you pointed to first, uh, they'd actually gone a number of years without raising rates. And so the first bar that you see that's very narrow and slim for them, right. this is based on the increase in their typical bill. Well, they did a, a large increase in their rates to generate more revenue, but they restructured their rates. So they redistributed the impact so that the typical bill was only about a 2% increase, but the overall increase in their revenues that they did was actually about 7 to 10%. And then you see another 10% increase in that second year. That's that really tall yes. bar. Yeah. So they did some rate restructuring to mitigate some of the impacts as part of their rate plan. Um, if you think about um, some of the others on the list, so Pasco County, they've been indexing their rates um, for water and sewer on average at about 3% a year for a while. But they're also a very high growth environment. So they're getting about 2 or so percent a year, if not more, in additional customers on the system which creates a lot of economies of scale. So all these new customers come in, uh, but a lot of the infrastructure has been built and it's covered. So now what they're getting is additional revenue now to go against those fixed costs. So they get some additional revenue from growth without much incremental cost. Um, Clearwater, they've been doing um, a rate adjustments for a long period of time. And so they've been indexing the rates and in the mid 2000s, they actually did some large adjustments, seven to 9% a year for several years in a while. And they've been tapering off to about 3% now for the last few years. Uh, but now they're looking at major infrastructure plans, particularly for their water reclamation facilities um, that are gonna be very expensive. So they're gonna be looking at potentially a different scenario and future of increases when you look beyond this time period because of the timing of their capital needs. So that timing comes into play when you look at some of these increases as well. So for Tampa, they had adopted a 20-year rate ordinance um, a few years ago, um, which is one of the longer ones that I've seen because they completed all of their infrastructure master plans. So those increases for Tampa, they're going to keep happening for a while. So when you look at their bill comparison chart, they may seem low today, but as you move forward and those level of increases continue to happen, their bill is going to come up. So timing is really a, a lot of what comes into play in these rate differentials in terms of when you're making the infrastructure investments and then just how <laughs> proactive you've been on adjusting your rates. So some communities like Safety Harbor, they did a five-year rate plan that was almost 12% increases per year. They're taking a little bit of a break <laughs> after going through that massive of a rate structure change and those revenue increases. So there's a lot of explanatory variables behind why some of these percentage plans are going to be different. And I think Tommy said it well, that we have to think about our cost requirements 
and the policy objectives that we want to have in terms of if we want to moderate these increases, you know, what do we want to do to try to affect that outcome? And that's what you see with some of these agencies like Clearwater and Pasco County. They're trying to get to steady indexing where they can. Other agencies, there's, there's some catch up involved or some other bigger issues at play um, with their infrastructure. So hopefully that helps put some context around this. Well, I, I wanted to ask that question because if you go only by these numbers, you can't. That's right. So thank you. I no appreciate problem. this. Um, if there's no other um, comments, I'd like to, did we do a motion yet? No, I'd like to have a motion to approve or whatever motion you would like to make in a second to that. So my motion would be to approve what the requested rate. It, it's the ordinance, approve ordinance 2020. Approve the ordinance with the requested rate of, let me just do, it's uh, ordinance 2023-22. Order and sewer rates. All right, sir. Second. Second. Um, second. Pardon me. If there's no further comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianas. Yes. Commissioner Koulias. No. Commissioner Eisner. Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt. Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis. Yes. Um, I want to thank all the residents for being here, and I again I invite you to contact the city staff and get an analysis done. Mr. Smith's very good. Mr. Kiger's very good at what they do. And I know our staff all the way down is very good as well. So thank you for being here. Okay, we're gonna go back to the ordinances and resolutions. Um, ordinance 2023-21, redesignation of green space. Ms. Kardash, if you could read that by title, please. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Ordinance number 2023, Dash 21, an ordinance of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, changing the use of a portion of an existing park facility located at the southeast corner of North Safford Avenue and Live Oak Street, 802 North Safford Avenue, from green space to pickleball courts in accordance with Section 8 of the Charter of the city of Tarpon Springs and providing for the effective date of this ordinance. This is second reading. There will be a third reading on October 17th, 2023, and was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title with a map on September 20th, 2023. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask Ms. Vincent, right? Yes. Ms. Vincent, could you just kind of give us a brief overview of what this is about? We had our first reading uh, two weeks ago, I believe, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, so again, basically we are redesignating um, approximately 10,500 square feet um, in the existing uh, recreation facility um, from you know, kind of underutilized or just green space right now to, uh, to that of pickleball courts. Um, pursuant to the board's discussion at the last meeting, um, we did add in um, a specific requirement that the ordinance, uh, regarding the effectiveness of the ordinance, um, subject to a site plan demonstrating court layouts. So, and then secondly, um, we do have attached with this in accordance with the um, change, change in state statute requirements, uh, business impact statement, which essentially is, you know, it would, we, this is, would be a positive impact for the area and not negatively affecting any existing businesses. So. Okay, thank you, Ms. Vincent. Uh, are there any public records on this item? This is designating uh, green space for recreational uses specifically big pickleball courts. Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, commissioner comments, any, any of the commissioners have a comment? Okay, I'd like to have a, uh, ask for a motion to approve ordinance 2023-21 re redesignation of green space. So moved. Uh, so moved. Second. I'm sorry, second. Okay, um, if there's no further commission comments, roll call please. Commissioner Koulianas? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lund? Yes. Mayor Vatikaitis? Uh, yes, uh, item 14 <coughs> was re withdrawn as I previously announced, item 15 is application 23-28, 1750 South Pine Ellis Avenue. Um, this, is, this involves three components, three ordinances, beginning with 2023-14 through 2023-16. Um, like we've done before, we'll have the single presentation 
that will be for all three ordinances, but we'll start using ordinance 2023-14 as, um, as the ordinance to utilize it as far as getting the presentation complete. So um, Ms. Kardash, I'm gonna ask you to read ordinance 2023-14 by title only, title only uh, provide us the instructions for the quasi-judicial meeting swear in any witnesses that we have and ask whatever necessary questions that you have to do of the commission. Right, thank you, Mayor. Ordinance 2023-14, an ordinance of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, annexing 1.3 acres more or less of real property located at 1750 South Pinellas Avenue, application 23-28, providing for findings and providing an effective date. This. As first reading, the second reading will be held on October 17th, 2023, and was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title with a map on August 30th, 2023, and October 4th, 2023. This matter uh, pending before the City of Tarpon Springs Board of Commissioners is quasi-judicial in nature. In a quasi-judicial proceeding, the commission's function is to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the City of Tarpon Springs Code of Ordinances. This is a legal decision regarding the application before the city. The commission may only consider evidence that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues arising from the application and the applicable code sections. Mm -hmm. If the evidence demonstrates that the application meets the criteria contained in the Code of Ordinances, then the commission is required by law to grant the applicant's request. If the evidence demonstrates that the application does not meet the code criteria, then the commission is required to deny the applicant's request. Any and all persons providing testimony at this hearing are required to do so under oath. All persons testifying at this hearing must give their name, address, and must indicate whether or not they have been sworn for the record prior to proceeding with their testimony. All testimony and questioning at this hearing must address matters that are relevant and material to the application under consideration based on the city's code of ordinances. Any members of the commission who have disclosures such as ex parte communications or conflicts of interest, please make your disclosures at the beginning of the hearing. The following is the established procedure which will be followed. First, city staff will present its testimony and evidence and the applicant will be given the opportunity to ask questions and cross-examine city staff and any city witnesses. Then the applicant will have the opportunity to present its witnesses and evidence and the city will have the opportunity to cross-examine the applicant and any of the applicant's witnesses. Members of the public opposing or in support of the application will then be given the opportunity to present their testimony and evidence and then the applicant and then the city may present any closing and rebuttal for consideration of the commission. At this time, anyone who will be presenting testimony at this hearing, please stand and face the clerk to receive the oath. Do you, do you want me to administer the oath? I'm sorry. Um, please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the testimony um, and truth on this matter before the City of Tarpon Springs Board of Commissioners here this evening? I do. All right, thank you. Please remember to state your name, address, and indicate that you've been sworn. Would you like to ask the uh, ex parte and also? Uh... Uh, yes, if anybody has any ex parte communications on this item, please go ahead and make those disclosures now. Um, if you have also any conflicts of interest, now would be the time to declare those as well. Okay, okay seeing none. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Kardash. Seeing Mayor Drew, of course, on the committee. Yeah, Ms. Vincent. Ms. Vincent. Thank you. This is application 23 28. Uh, for, oops, all right. Uh, this is property located at 1750 South Pinellas Avenue. This is an application for annexation and the associated land use and uh, zoning uh, that would need to be applied to the property should the annexation be approved. Um, this application is before you tonight because the applicant um, has, is requesting city utility ser services on the property. Uh, in this instance, it is for uh, to get the property off of septic. So it's a mandatory application so um, I just wanted to get that into the record very quickly um, this is the site on uh, South Pinellas Avenue um, it's contiguous across uh, alt 19 with existing city proper uh, city municipality property 
uh, this is the aerial uh, view of the site. Um, uh, the site is, um, has a personal services as well as a car lot. And then the back of the site is being used for like boat storage and things of that nature. And just some pictures of the site. Uh, the property contains 1.3 acres. If it is annexed, the uh, future land use map designation on the property would be commercial general, uh, which is how, what is also in Pinellas County. And uh, the rezoning would go from the county designation of C2 to the uh, city designation of HB, that is the most comparable designation. Um, as I already stated, the uh, purpose of the request was to uh, abandon the septic and connect to the city's uh, wastewater service. Um, under the review criteria, I'm just going to really highlight the, um, the sticking point with this. Under our new criteria, if you recall, we amended the land development code regarding annexations re uh, review criteria, and we included the ability for the city to consider non-conforming uh, instances, um, you know, code enforcement uh, actions, things that are pending in Pinellas County as part of the analysis. Uh, for this particular property, there is a code enforcement, ongoing code enforcement issue in Pinellas County um, that the city essentially would be inheriting um, if we do annex the property. Um, the the owner has indicated during the um, uh, during the planning and zoning board review that they do not wish to annex into the property. They recognize that they are paying the surcharge, but they are fine with that. Um, the Planning and Zoning Board did review this and they unanimously recommended um, denial uh, of the annexation, as did staff. Uh, we recommended denial as well because of the ongoing issues in Pinellas County. So um, with that, I will st uh, stop and answer any questions that you have about the annexation or the proposed uh, zoning and land use. Okay, uh, do any commissioners have any questions concerning this item? This, any of the three ordinances, okay. Um, let me ask the um, applicant, did you have any questions of Ms. Vincent? Okay. Um, Ms. Vincent, um, I'm going to ask if you'd like the city staff report accepted into evidence. Yes, for okay. the annexation and uh, the <coughs> land use and zoning. Okay. Um, Ma'am, if you'd like to have any comments that you'd like to make to the commission, and they may have an opportunity to ask you a question as well. Doreen Issa Carter, 31 Bayward Drive, Palm Harbor, Florida, 34683, and I'd been sworn in. Um, did, did you have any comments that you'd like to make? Okay. Um, commissioners, do you have any com um, questions concerning the, for the applicant? I see none. Um, Ms. Vincent, obviously, there's no... no. Uh, um, okay, I'm going to go to public comments now. Uh, you, you're fine. You could sit down for right now. Okay. Um, are there any public comments concerning this item? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Vincent, do you have any closing or summation remarks? No. Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing. I'm going to go back to the commission and see if you've got any uh, comments that you'd like to make concerning this item. Any comments, not questions. Okay. Um, if I have, if I may have a motion to approve ordinance 2023-14, the annexation, and a second. <laughs> so me, motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay. If there's no further comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Kulianis. Order. So this is to approve the annexation. Staff, you've recommended denial. We, of the we, okay. we, we vote no. I just want to be clear. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, roll call, please. Commissioner Kulianis. No. Commissioner Kulias. No. Commissioner Eisner. No. Vice Mayor Lunt? No. Mayor Vaticiotis? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, item B, Ordinance 2023-15, Future Land Use Map Amendment 
Um, we heard the presentation. Did you have anything else to add on that? Okay. No. Um, so, uh, Mayor, on these particular items, they're dependent on the annexation. So we don't need to move forward if there's not going to be an annexation because you can't amend a future land use map or rezone the property without the first ordinance passing. That's fine. We just easy. Would, do we need in to do anything, Ms. Kardash? Um, uh, we probably should recognize that in some way for the minutes. Uh, well, I still need to read the title then for okay. you to vote on it, and you still have to open the public hearing and take right. comment then. Okay. So ordinance 2023-15, an ordinance of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the future land use map for 1.3 acres, more or less, of real property located at 1750 South Pinellas Avenue from Pinellas County land use designation, commercial general to city of Tarpon Springs land use designation, commercial general, application number 23-28, providing for findings and providing an effective date. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask the public whether they have any public comments concerning this item. Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Now, Ms. Kardash, so I understand, do we still make a motion on this and deny it or we don't need to do anything? And now that we've gone through the public hearing, yes, you do need to do that. We should go ahead yes. and make a motion and deny it? Yes. Okay. Um, may I have a motion to approve? So and, moved. And second. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, if there's no further commission comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Kalianis? No. Jacuyas? No. Commissioner Eisner? No. Vice Mayor Lunt? No. Mayor Vatikiotis? No. Um, Item C, which is the ordinance 2023-16, Ms. We'll do we'll handle that the same way, Ms. Kardash, if you could read that by title. Thank you, Mayor. Ordinance number 2023-16, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the official zoning atlas of the City of Tarpon Springs for 1.3 acres more or less of real property located at 1750 South Pinellas Ave. Avenue from Pinellas County Zoning Designation C2, General Commercial and Services, to City of Tarpon Springs Zoning Designation HB, Highway Business, application number 23-28, providing for findings and providing an effective date. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kardash. Um, I'm gonna ask the public if they have any comments concerning this item. This is for the rezoning. Um, Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? Online, would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand. You'll be allowed in to talk. <coughs> and we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. If there's no commission uh, questions or comments, I'd like to have a motion to approve 2023-16 rezoning. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, if there's no further commission comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Kulianis? No. Commissioner Kulias? No. Commissioner Eisner? No. Vice Mayor Lutt? No. Mayor Vatikiotis? No. Okay, let's move on to item 16, application 23-81, 1599 Rainville Road. This too has three items, the same same approach. Um, I'm gonna ask Ms. Art Kardash to read ordinance 2023-17, the annexation by title. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor. Ordinance 2023-17, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, annexing 4.82 acres, more or less, of real property located at 1599 Rainville Road, application 23-81, providing for findings and providing an effective date. Um, this item is um, set for second reading on October 17th, 2023, and was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title with a map on August 20th, 2023, and October 4th, 2023. This is quasi-judicial in nature. Okay, and um, I think we need to swear in the um, um, anyone that is gonna be- um, I don't see the applicant here. Okay, and you've already been sworn, so. I have, is yes. there anybody else who wants to speak on this item that needs to be sworn in at this time? Okay, seeing none. Okay, Ms. Vincent, thank you. Thank you, this Thank is application 23-81. This is also an annexation application. Uh, the property is up here at the tip of um, 
this is the where Rainville Road curves around. It's actually right next to uh, the city's uh, temporary uh, spoil site um, and near the uh, the fire station and the and the plant or the water uh, plant. Um, this property is um, again they're annexing for. Um, for water service. Um, so this is a mandatory review of application for, for the annexation. Uh, the applicant uh, similarly has uh, publicly stated at the Planning and Zoning Board that they do not wish to annex into the city. Um, the, the property use itself is a metal recycling facility. It's all done, you know, kind of outdoors. Um, it is it has a legal non-conforming status with its zoning in Pinellas County, but it is a non-conforming use. So if we were to annex it in, we would indeed be annexing in a non-conforming use itself. Um, I'll just go ahead and flip through the area so you can see the site. Um, this here is this all surface, um, you know, kind of open air use. And so it's, um, there's a lot going on there that's just been there for a very long time and so but it is recognized as legally non-conforming uh, however similarly to the last application we are recommending denial uh, the planning and zoning board did recommend denial as well because of the extensive not not the non-conformity um, in uh, comparison to the allowable uses that would um, would under the zoning and the land use that the property has of Metellus County and would have coming into the city of Tarpon Springs. Um, so I'm just going to kind of short circuit the presentation and you know, bring it back to the board for discussion. All right, are there any questions from the commission? Yeah, I actually have just a couple of arcane questions. <laughs> um, we supply them with water currently. Gus metals. They're hooking up to water. They're, they are hooking up. That's that's what's compelling the request is water service. Oh, okay. So we, I'm, because I'm looking at a at a permit that was applied to for Pinellas County where it says they already have water from us and they already have sewer connection from us, which is I thought was kind of strange. Um, oh, I'm not exactly sure why it says that they they, they are hooking up to the city's water service. Are or maybe, or, or maybe it's additional service. service, you know, so. Are they going to hook up to our service whether they're annexed or not? Yes, yes. So if they don't have any wastewater capabilities on site, either septic or sewage, how, how do they do this? One moment, please. Because as far as I'm aware, there's no septic on this site either. And I know we have sewage facilities in the area, but they're not anywhere close. Um, I just don't understand how they can have water and have no place to put it. I, I mean, I know that's on the well, applicant, they, but. No, I, I mean, I've got a comment, but I don't think it's my place to say it. Um, we'll wait <laughs> yeah, for Ms. Exactly. Vincent to iron that out. Then we'll, I am. Um, then we'll go into the. <laughs> Sanitary sewer service capacity is available, but there is no service infrastructure to the property. Um, fire service is provided by the city. Solid waste. Um, yeah, I wish the applicant was here. Yeah, to my knowledge, they're simply asking for for water service, so. I don't even know how they've been operating as long as they have. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> no questions for me, thank you. Are there any other commission comments? Okay. Um, Ms. Vincent, would you like your staff report uh, accepted into evidence? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the applicant is not here, and um, let's go to public comments. Are there any public comments concerning this item? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna close the public hearing and I'm gonna go back to the, uh, the agenda on this thing. Um, do any commissioners have any comments? I would assume not. If not, um, may I have a motion to approve Ordinance 2023-17, the annexation for 1599 Rainville Road, and a second. So moved. Second. Okay. 
If there's no further commission comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? No. Commissioner Kouyas? No. Commissioner Eisner? No. Vice Mayor Lunt? No. Mayor Vatikiotis? No. Um, Ms. Kardash, if you can read Ordinance 2023-18, please. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Ordinance 2023-18, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the future land use map for 4.82 acres, more or less, of real property located at 1599 Rainville Road from Pinellas County land use designation E, Employment, to City of Tarpon Springs land use designation IL, Industrial Limited, application number 23-81, providing for findings and providing an effective date. This is first reading. Second reading will be held on October 17th, 2023 and was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title with a map on August 30th and October 4th of 2023. Okay. I'm going to go to public comments. Are there any public comments on this item? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? Mr. Anyone Jumper. online? Speak on this item, please raise your hand and you will, you'll be allowed in to talk. Is that, is that remote? Jump. Okay. And we do not have to raise hands at this time. Thank you. Um, okay, that's the public comments. Um, if there's no uh, commission comments, may I have an or, uh, a motion to approve ordinance 2023-18, the future land use map? So moved. Second. Okay. If there's no further commission comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? No. Commissioner Koulias? No. Commissioner Eisner? No. Vice Mayor Lutt? No. Mayor Vatikiotis? Uh, no. Um, ordinance 2023-19, the rezoning. Ms. Kardash, if you could read that by title, please. Yes, thank you. Ordinance number 2023-19, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the official zoning atlas of the City of Tarpon Springs for 4.82 acres more or less of real property located at 1599 Rainville Road from Pinellas County Zoning Designation E1 Employment 1 to City of Tarpon Springs Zoning Designation IR Industrial Restricted, application number 23-81, providing for findings and providing an effective date. This is first reading, second and final reading will be on October 17th, 2023, and was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title with a map on August 30th and October 4th, 2023. Okay, thank you. Um, let me go to public comments. Are there any public comments on this one? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Any commissioner comments? Um, if not, may I have a, a motion to approve 2023-19 rezoning? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, if there's no further commission comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? No. Commissioner Kouyas? No. Commissioner Eisner? No. Vice Mayor Lund? No. Mayor Vakiotis? No. Okay, um, that ends our quasi-judicial items. Uh, item 17, resolution 2023-36, identifying city property for affordable housing. Ms. Kardash, if you can read this by title, please. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Resolution number 2023-36, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, identifying and declaring available city-owned real property that would meet the requirements for affordable housing, incorporating findings, providing for severability, providing for an effective date. This is first and final reading. Okay. City Manager, of course, I'm gonna go to Ms. Vincent. Yes. Ms. Vincent, please, your presentation. Uh, yes, I'll be very brief. So under the Live Local Act, we are required, the city is required uh, to, um, to basically adopt a resolution identifying city-owned property that may be suitable for affordable housing. We went through uh, the identified 163 parcels, um, and really we've only arrived at, there's you know six lots out there right now that could be suitable for affordable housing. As it would happen, we are working with Habitat for Humanity on several of those lots already. Um, so this just basically puts it out to the public that these lots are available. Um, but for our purposes, we are actively working with Habitat for Humanity to put single family homes on these lots. So this is to meet the live local requirement. Okay, um, I'm gonna go to public comments. Are there any public comments concerning this matter? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? 
Anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, I'm going to ask the commission whether any of you have any questions uh, for Ms. Vincent concerning this item. Just a quick question. Yeah. Go ahead, Commissioner Eisen. Are there any uh, violations on these properties? I did not run code enforcement, but uh, I did not run a check on that at this yet. So I do not, I don't have an answer for you. I don't know. Well, just because I, I wouldn't want them to transfer on to Habitat for Humanity if Actually. they, you understand? <laughs> Some of those we nice. have, some of those we have actually, and you're going to see some of those on the agenda item I coming up. I apologize. So, um, the ones that uh, there's a couple that are recently identified that are I don't know the status of them, but generally speaking, um, like the mobile home lot. I mean, we foreclosed on it, we took it, so I, they're generally there should they should be fairly clean but there may be liens you're going to see some coming up here in, in on a future later agenda item tonight where we're asking to reduce liens on a property that habitat acquired but that's that's not part of this they've already owned that one so short answer is i don't know can we check into that before yes. we yes this okay uh, I, one thing i do want to point out is that these are city owned lots so right. they they shouldn't have any code Leans on them. Or code enforcement better. issues. Thank on you them. Yes. for bailing yes. me out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, any other commissioners? Have qu I'm sorry. Were you done, Commissioner? Yes. Yes. Okay. Any other commissioners with questions? Yes. Uh, Go ahead, Commissioner Cleos. Ms. Vincent, there's the two lists. There's. Uh, it says Boyer Street. Where exactly is that on Boyer Street, ma'am? It is at the south. Excuse me. The north west corner of Diston and Boyer. And the city's owned that one for quite some time. Um, that is not one that is, that's one that we just identified. So uh, it's, it's a single family lot. It's just there. Um, there's no real purpose identified for it. Okay. And then the, the Park Street. Can you help me with that one, yeah. Mark? <laughs> Park Street. Um, We've been working to try to do something with that for a couple of years. The problem is, um, and I don't know, longtime family, the Reckley family owns a piece of property just to the north of it. The problem is, and they had it when I was little, I remember doing the cut with the Reckley house, the cut right back here to the land. The problem is that property is landlocked through whatever happened and stuff is the landlocked piece. Our piece is just to the other side of it. So we've been working with the Reckley family because it's been in probate and different things. We've been working with them because there's an option. We either need to give them an option of an access to it or what we've tried to send them to is Habitat for Humanity to buy their portion that's landlocked and then Habitat for Humanity can come in with us um, to do something. We haven't involved that with Habitat and Manatee because we got that piece of property as landlocked. So we kind of hold that to wait till the Reckley family, again, a long time family here, so they can resolve that piece. And then together, um, and it's right this next block on the other side of Safford there, it's right about in the, in the middle. Um, so we're just waiting for them to the probate and everything to get done. He just called me last week, so he's working with that. And he's gonna be working with Habitat for Humanity so hopefully we can turn that whole thing and we'll not have a landlocked lot. We'll have one lot together that a nice home can be built in for somebody in the community. Now, uh, Ms. Vincent, uh, I, I'm looking at uh, property 411 South Safford Avenue and 421 South Safford Avenue. Those are two properties right next to one another? I believe, I believe yeah, I believe they are. And that, that is, just for the residents to know, that is on the trail. It's actually yes. uh, pretty much across the street on both sides from, well, there's a, an apartment complex, we Santos Isles, and then cameras. diagonally, there's there's some other commercial buildings and areas. And uh, I don't want to list those properties as affordable houses. Uh, as there, there's right across the street, there's two, there's two properties that... Uh, Right now, they're they're grandfathered into their business to their building, but unfortunately, they can't remodel or do anything. And I, I think uh, that Safford Avenue area is somewhere we need to rezone and make it multi-use uh, on the trail. And so I don't want to go ahead and, and 
designated as a affordable housing when I think we can get some more out of it, out of that area and what we're trying to do to enhance the city and promote mixed use and the Pinellas Trail and all that. So the legislature did not give you an option. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, basically what they required uh, all municipal municipalities and counties to do is to look at all the city owned property that is owned by the government, the, the city in this case, in fee simple. And you own this in fee simple. And the question is not whether or not you want to as a city, it's whether or not it could be developed as affordable housing by the city. It doesn't require you to develop it as affordable housing, but you are required to list it as property that could potentially be developed for affordable housing by this resolution. Um, that's what was required by the Live Local Act. Um, and uh, it, it sounds kind of con uh, contradictory. You do have properties that you are developing. So I understand, you know, why there, there may be a view that it has to be. Um, but pursuant to this resolution, it doesn't have to be. It's just capable of being put to that use. Um, and that's what this resolution says. Okay. And, and uh, you had mentioned what there's a list of what, seven properties. And you said there were there was a lot more properties that could have been identified? Well, the, the city has, well, we have uh, about 160 properties. You know, some are, you know, government buildings, you know, they're thing, stormwater ponds and things of that nature. So these are not identified for any particular city use right now. Oh, okay. Um, and they are zoned for residential. So that's kind of where, where, where we are. All right, so I'm just gonna go along with this, but I don't like it. I, I think we need to, as soon as possible, rezone that Safford Avenue. If we wanna enhance the trail and promote mixed use and a walkable town, and that's not a spot for two single family homes. That, that's, that's where the start of the trail starts, and you see there's bars and breweries and you know other areas picking up, and, and I think we as a city need to try to rezone that to create an economic opportunity that the downtown's desiring and, and with this whole walkability thing that's uh, starting to approach main town, you know, downtowns all across the country. So. Just a short version, Renee. Those two people, there's a lot of county owned, that's the, Renee, explain yes, it. So there, there's, there's a lot a, of county owned, go ahead, go ahead and Yeah, there's, there's you know, almost like, you know, there's a whole face block along Safford that is a combination of county owned property, um, the county housing, um, it's not the housing authority, it's the housing finance authority owned, and then you have the city owned properties. So there's an assemblage of properties there under um, government, I'll call it, or you know, ownership that we hope to see be developed in a cohesive manner, not just here, here and there. So we're working with the county um, I mean, candidly, Habitat is interested in those, but the, you know, so we're looking at a, a, we're hoping to get a cohesive project along along the trail. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people are interested in those properties, but those are very delicate properties in, in trying to enhance what we're trying to do in this city. And so affordable housing, two homes right there, it's not the best interest when we can put a multi-use store and some livable space up top and really try to enhance the trail and the other nearby businesses in that area. So I'll go along with it right now, but I'm not interested in giving it to Habitat for Humanity. I'm interested in, in having that rezoned with some other counties and with, with the county if needed to enhance that area like, like we need to. So thank you. Um, Commissioner Asher, I'm gonna go to Vice Mayor Lunt first. And sure. He has go not ahead. spoken. Go ahead, Vice Mayor Lunt. I, I actually agree with Commissioner Coolius. I think best best use of these properties is probably mixed use, but we don't have to sell them. They just have to be on this list. So <laughs> yes. <and> I'm sad. <laughs> okay, Commissioner Eisner. Well, I have two points. I agree with Commissioner Coolius and as, as well as the Vice Mayor um, as mixed use. But were these properties taken off the list? Uh, for possible uses as a any in the parking study at all? 
Were any properties taken off the list? Meaning, were any of these properties um, considered or possibly used for the parking study? These this, on yes. this list? No, sir. Okay. So they, these would have at least have been looked at and ha we didn't have a need for them to be used. Correct. On. Correct. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Okay. If there's no further uh, commissioner comments, I'm going to ask for a, um, we've gone to public comments. I'm going to ask for a motion to approve resolution 2023-36. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Um, if there's no further commission comments, roll call, please, Ms. Jacobs. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Cool, yes. yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lutt? Yes. Mayor Yes. Um, we'll go back to the special consent agenda and we're going to pick up with the uh, award file number 24007, single source purchase of a Kayla high water emergency response vehicle. Um, Janina and uh, Fire Chief Scott Young. Uh, we want to start? Chief Young? Good evening. Scott Young, Fire Chief. I bring forward a uh, request to purchase a Sela Montera a high water rescue vehicle uh, from General Body Manufacturing. Uh, during the recent hurricane, um, while we were working the EOC, we had a couple of incidents of high water rescues we needed to make, plus structure fires. And we had a hard time getting our crews into these areas. Uh, <clears throat> We immediately noticed, noticed during the while working the EOC that we didn't have the vehicles to do this in an efficient way. So we started working on this while we were in the EOC. Our procurement director immediately started looking these vehicles up, see what we could find as soon as possible. Uh, I know this is a vehicle that uh, is is unique. I know this is a vehicle that. Uh, um, will be used for certain types of incidences, uh, but we hope we never have to use this vehicle, but it's, the reality is we probably will at some point. Uh, as first responders, you know, we work in the if world. If we have this incident, what are we gonna use? What are we gonna be able to get crews in and out with? And this is a vehicle that we can use. Um, so I bring this forward and I'll answer any questions that you might have uh, regarding this vehicle. I will tell you that uh, a couple other cities are actually looking at this, these vehicles today, these exact vehicles. St. Pete is looking for two of them just like this. Again, Clearwater is also looking for two of these same manufactured vehicles because of the recent storm that they had problems getting in and out of uh, with their crews. So I uh, opened up for any questions. Also the fact that this event, that we beat everybody else out and we've got a vehicle yes. that we don't have to wait six months to put together as a vehicle ready to go now. Yes, that's this is a demo unit that's point. available today. Uh, Commissioner Koulianis, your light is on. Is this vehicle, vehicle going to save lives? Oh, absolutely. I think it will. It'll be able to get... One of the problems we have at this, at the Chesapeake fires, we couldn't get our firefighters and equipment in right. because we didn't have any high water vehicles, and we had residents in there that were trapped that we had to get out. Fortunately, people live in flooded areas. They don't leave when the storms come in. They think it's not going to be so bad. When things start happening, then they call us. And that's when we have to get in. Yeah, I support it. Okay. Um, any other questions, uh, Vice Mayor Lund? Um Speaking as one who couldn't get out of their neighborhood, uh, the only question I really have is: is this is a, a quarter of a million dollar purchase? Where's the money going to come from? Uh, the finance director has uh, earmarked the money from uh, splitting it between uh, penny money and uh, some of the general fund money. We are also hoping that we can get money from the state for this storm later that can replenish that amount. Okay, so some of it's gonna come from penny fund, some, some of it's from the gonna general come fund. from general fund? General fund is- But we do have enough money or- Yes, Switch yes. in the budget to cover this? That, according to the finance director, yes. Oh, then I'm fine, thank you. Um, okay, um, Commissioner Eisner. What did we use? Um, to get the uh, fire people in and out? We used outside resources. Um, we used the uh, Sheriff's Department uh, and the National Guard to get our people in there. Um, we flooded, other communities didn't flood. If this storm was bigger, if this storm was closer to the coast, 
those communities throughout that didn't flood could be flooded and those resources may not have gotten to us. So we would like to make sure we have resources of our own to do the job we need to do to save our citizens. Is there any other vehicle that we have right now that can go through high water? May not be as fancy as this one, I understand. Um, to bring fire people in and help out. It may not be able to rescue people, I understand. But you know, we could get hit with 15 feet of water Mm -hmm. And this will have no value to us. So then we need to go into boats. Um, I don't know if you can circumvent every sort of incident by let's buy the next vehicle that would have helped us at this ve- with this storm, but not helped us because I know this vehicle only goes up to four or five feet. Correct. And we could he be in ten feet, and then this vehicle's of no value except that we just paid four hundred thousand dollars for it. Where the price of the vehicle is, we put in 250 because of the transportation costs may go up. The actual vehicle price, as quoted right now, is 238. But if you look on the quote, it has a line that says, due to transportation costs being pretty much unpredictable, these could go up. So we put a little buffer there in case that was to happen. So it's about 250, but I don't think we're going to spend all that. But you have maintenance of it. We have maintenance yeah. over the time of the vehicle, 10 to 15 year lifespan, correct. Uh, like any vehicle, it has to be maintained. This vehicle would stay inside one of our fire bays, so it's not out in the elements. Uh, the firefighters are diligent in working vehicles, making sure they run. We work our trucks every day, every week. So it's not going to sit stagnant and just deteriorate. It'll be worked. It'll be used. We can use it for other events if we need it. Uh, off the road rescues uh, in the parks that we have issues with getting back into and getting uh, patients out of. Uh, we've had those issues where we had to carry them out a mile or so, so we, we'd have other uses for it if we needed it. In the last 10 years, have you had use of this? Uh, for flooding, I would say in the last 10 years, no. But again, like I said, our job is to live in the if world. You know. So we buy vehicles, we buy equipment if we need it, and that's in order to save lives. Well, everything you buy saves lives. So. I don't use that only as a criteria. Believe me, I'm not trying to be harsh at all. I'm trying to put dollars and cents of, you know, what we need as we're not clear water. We don't have their funds. We're not St. Pete. We don't have their funds that they could be buying three or four of them. Um, so I'm, I'm in favor of saving lives. I'm in favor of having something that can uh, be utilized what I'm not in favor of something that is to be utilized so infrequent. Um, you know, if, if we're going to get hit with a direct storm, um, I don't see this being something that it's going to help us on four or five feet. Um, I, I'll just, no joking aside, I'm just as soon come pick up Vice Mayor on my boat. <laughs> um, but. All, all joking aside, it, you, you're going to need boats. You're not going to need a high water vehicle. Um, so for me, I, I don't 100% agree with spending this kind of money, and I'd love to be able to see this money being spent towards um, other things unless we can get grants. Um, I would push this off for now and not want to agree with it and see if we can get a grant to um, help subsidize this. Because at this point, it's too much money for a one-shot deal. Okay. Okay, Commissioner Kriyas. Uh, Chief, that SWAT vehicle we have, and we also have Chief Young, that SWAT vehicle we have with the police department, how high of water does that go through? It could probably withstand about four feet of water as well. But uh, during the storm, we started to take that out during that rescue. Uh, The brake seized up on it. Uh, We have used it in past storms in the past to get into high water areas. Uh, But due to the maintenance on it, uh, that was an issue during the storm. Sure. Um, uh, My my concern is, and even if there is a big hurricane and we get flooded big time, at some point the water starts receding. And, you know, if it recedes to a point where a truck like this is able to be utilized, it's helping make a difference. 
and yeah, I haven't seen the water come up to my driveway and since the 93 no name storm, you know, and I, I'm, I don't know if we ever will, hopefully not. But I, I think this is a, a vehicle that we need to be smart about in trying to protect this city and the residents in it and, and being able to get to them faster. If uh, we had this vehicle, we could have got, we could have got out to the, the fire on Chesapeake as soon as possible. We, we could have, Chief. Yes, we could have gotten out there a lot quicker. I think it was about close to 20, 30 minutes before we were able to get crews out there. If we had had this vehicle readily available, we would have been there within you know, 10, 15 minutes. Sure. So, I mean, I hope, I hope we, we never have to use it, but, but at some point I, I think it's um, important to have considering the city we are and, and you know, sea level that we're at and just the way our the way it is and it's just hard to, to not support it especially um, after what we just witnessed and you know it could be much worse too so uh, I'm gonna support it thank you okay um, chief the, the, um, I know uh, Chief Jeff Young was asked about the, our one vehicle. How much, how high of water would this one go through? This one will go through about the same amount of water, about four feet of water. So four feet of water. About four feet. Okay. Yeah. Um, the one concern I have: this is a new animal for us. I mean, ladder trucks, I understand. Fire trucks, I understand. EMS rescue, I understand. Everything that we've had, we we renew. This one is a new animal. Um, I. I see the, the backup, but I'm just not comfortable with having all the details associated with it. Um, and also that with somebody, oh, the, the differences between the two vehicles as well that are being proposed and why you chose the one. Um, I'm all for, um, you know, supporting this concept. I'm just not ready to support it based on what I know tonight. If um, and, and I was going to ask you, was there any kind of, um, uh, you know, presentation or anything like that? I, I, I know, I don't know whether you spoke to other commissioners about this as far as any kind of detail, as far as a type of vehicle. I just don't think it, in, in good conscience for me just to go ahead and, and um, sign off on something that I really don't understand. I, I'm not questioning the ability. I just, from a fiduciary responsibility, I just feel obligated. I, I need to have some more information before I make my decision. There isn't a whole lot in the backup right now on this. That, that's, and there may be support, but that's how I feel about it. I mean, again, I'm, I'm supportive of the concept. I'm just not ready to support this right now, not for a quarter of a million dollars. So, um, Vice Mayor Lunt, did you want to say something else? Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that this is a $400,000 over 15 year investment. It's an insurance policy. If we had not been able to access, um, actually I didn't see the other vehicles, but I saw the National Guard vehicles, we could have lost more homes and we, could have, we, st we stood a severe chance of actually having people lost as well. So this is, this is not a, a facetious, you know, searched by, I, I don't believe by our, our, our fire department to, uh, to just get another vehicle. I'm sure the last thing he needs is another vehicle to, to maintain and staff and so forth. But we did not have the vehicles. And we had to have firemen trying to, to waste walk hoses up, uh, uh, you know, a half a mile of, of paved street. It was not what you want to see in an emergency at all. And and granted, yes, it's only good for uh, 50 inches of water, which is four foot three inches or whatever. And you know, if it's up to six feet, it may not be, it may not be useful until that water recedes. But there's going to be lots of instances when it is up there. You should see the way it floods around this thing. With and this was brushed by four and a half foot storm surge. We're going to get more of those. I guarantee you we're going to get more of those. It's not getting any better. So I, I think from a, 
uh, a fiduciary responsibility thing, yeah, I'm looking at it, I'm going like, oh, wow, quarter million dollars, that's a pretty big ask. Out of the blue, after we've already done budgets, it wasn't prepared for and so forth. But then when I look at it at uh, overall cost of $400,000 or 420 or whatever it turned out to be over a, over a 15 year period, then that's just an insurance policy. And at that, I think it's a pretty cheap one. Anyway, thank you. Um, let me follow up. Has, has anybody from the fire department driven one of these? No, but there are some other departments that have vehicles similar to this that use this type of vehicle. But no, we have not driven this and one. Has anybody gone out to look at this thing? No, we will going out once it's approved. We go out to test drive and everything else. If we aren't happy with it, we would turn it down at that point. Okay. Um, a couple of lights are on. I don't know who did theirs first. Uh, I, I think Vice Mayor Lund already spoke. Commissioner Eisner, you. Yeah, you, I, I just had a. I, I know I was flooded out too, as you were. You could not get down Riverside Drive. Um, and I believe uh, they were using Silverados to drive through that gully of sea breeze. And um, my question is is there any other type of vehicle that we can utilize? I mean, I see, and, and I, I'm, I'm being completely ignorant on this, but I see these trucks that are just elevated, you know, you need a ladder to get in them. Um, they look higher than these high running vehicles. Could those be bought, elevated and used where the brakes are just as sacrificial as, as uh, the SWAT teams want? You know, um, that's one of the things that, unless you take care of the SWAT team vehicle, when you need it, it's not there this could be the same situation. You know, we, we live in a salt environment and, you know, I know what happens to uh, boat trailers and, you know, this is just, is there any other cheaper way to do this that we could still look into? Because it's, it's at the early stage. We, we don't have to do it this minute. Um, but is there a way that we can look at something that's more sacrificial? I don't know what the the amount of water those Silverados can go through. I'm not sure about that. Right. Um, I know that they can't haul a lot of stuff in that we might need, and they can't haul the number of people that we might need to get out. Right. This vehicle here will haul about 30 people in, 30 people out at one time. So I, I can't answer that question. I don't know what the Silverados can handle as far as water. Because, I, I mean, the only thing you lose when you go through salt water is the ABS brakes. Mm -hmm. Um, but the brakes themselves, they, they'll hold up. So, I mean, I, I just don't know. That's what they use to go through. And I actually even called the city manager and I asked if they had a rinsing process because they were running through salt water. Um, so I'm just curious if there's, you know, if you had two or three of those, you know, for the price of what this unit is, it might be, you know, you might be able to be in more locations than just having one unit. And I think the Silverados were out in multiple areas at the same time doing stuff. So I get it. But those were not raised Silverados. Those are regular, you know, right. city vehicles. I'm talking about something, you know, getting very raised. But we have talked to the uh, fleet department about modifying some of those vehicles with snorkel types to get into some water. But I don't know what the depth of the water they can go into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would just like to get some more facts and figures because again, it's, it's not a safety issue that I'm concerned about. I, I'm, I'll spend more money than that. I, I just, I want to make sure that we're making the right decision and not putting all our eggs in one basket when we could maybe have, you know, for that cost, three or four of these, you know, units that can run through water like that. First of all. Okay. Um, are there any other, uh, Commissioner Kuryash, you've got the light on. Yes, I just want to, look, looking back at the backup, uh, we do see the funding is coming from the fire department and the, the fire control machinery and equipment. I don't know if that's penny funded or, or not, but we made national news, guys. We made national news w with that fire. It, you know, it was just 
poking out the top, you saw the sponge docks. Um, we, we got the most waterfront property in Pinellas County. Uh, you guys think this thing can last 15 years? I don't see how it can't be a bad or safe investment to try to get the people that are in distress, you know, and that's, that's really how I look at it. And so I just think it's something that our, our city may be able to need. And if you guys may want to bring it back to talk more about it, you could try to put it out there, but I think uh, we need to move forward to, how much time do we have this option to buy this? truck that's it they have a demo available right now if we uh we told them we were interested so i'm sure they're waiting for us to make a decision before some other city comes in and swipes it up oh boy so i i make a motion we award we approve the award file number 2400007 njl do I have a second? Second. Okay, um, are there any further commission comments? Because I have one. Yes, I would please consider to see if they have a, a snorkel attachment to that. <laughs> I think it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chief, did, is there, did you ask them, or is there any possibility of putting a, a down payment as a placeholder until Maybe we had some guys go out there and actually drive it around. They do require down payment. I mean, I, I don't want to buy something that, you know, we've bought things in the past. I can name them we that do. we haven't used. They've just sit there and they've, they've, we're, we, we thought we needed them, but they doesn't happen. And all they do is they just, because we don't need them, there's other priorities that we need to pay attention to, like your main you know, like your main equipment, but we bought other equipment that just basically dilapidates and we just sell it as, as, uh, as surplus or whatever. I just want to make sure. Point of order, is, it, is this discussion on the motion? Yes, and I'm discussing okay. the motion. I got you. I got you. Um, if, if, if you had any discussion like that. Well, part of the deal is we put a down payment down, we fly out a couple of people to take a look at this, vehicle, they test it, they drive it, they get trained on it to make sure it's everything that we want and that they're comfortable with it, and they report back saying, yes, it's good to go, and then we move forward with the purchase if it's approved. Yes, we, we, we're not just going to go buy it sight unseen. We're going to test drive it. We're going to play with so, it and make sure it so works. So our motion is to award the file, but those conditions you just stated are not in that. Is that correct? I think in it's the, part of the purchase, correct? I, I guess, Ms. Lewis, thank you for being here. Uh, those terms weren't discussed with the vendor themselves, but we certainly could, uh, if you want to move forward with trying to obtain this vehicle, try to negotiate that option. I, there's a motion on the floor. I just wanted to make sure when I voted, I at least had some additional information and there was a possibility of putting a placeholder in down a, a down payment. I do believe they would go until for it our guys actually got out there. He is holding the vehicle for us to make a decision. Okay. Yes. So, um, unless there's some other. Go ahead. I just would like you to really reconsider this. Um, we need a fire station on Gulf, and that where I'd like to see that money that's more important than a vehicle that is going to possibly sit idle or be used possibly. Um, but that's where I'm going to stay with this. I don't support this. No, I, again, let me just say for myself, I, I'm supportive of this. This is not the issue. I just want to make sure we, we buy something. It's something that we've driven, we like it, and you don't come back and say, geez, I, you know, we didn't really, that's all. And, but the motion currently does not include that provision in there. Okay. Right. So call the motion. Vote. Uh, Ms. Jacobs, roll call, please. Commissioner Kulianis? Yes. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? No. 
Vice Mayor Lund? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? No. Okay. Let's move on to item. Let's see, that was order file number nine, River Bend Tree Mitigation Transportation Impact Fees. Ms. Vincent. Thank you. Um, this agenda item is to resolve a couple of remaining items with the River Bend subdivision development, um, namely the outstanding tree mitigation requirements and um, their developer's request for transportation impact fee. Uh, credits, if you will. So a little background, um, the prop this, this property, this is the site here, you have, this is the residential portion, um, and then you have the, the industrial portion. Um, this proper, this was developed in unincorporated county and was annexed into the city after the site infrastructure was completed. As part of that development, the developer constructed Brady Road which is a, a, a platted public road. Um, they also were required to upgrade this intersection to a three-way stop. Um, the, the internal drive circulation is not what is of issue uh, with the request for transportation impact fees. It really is related to the developer's cost, cost to construct Brady Road um, and as well as the required um, intersection improvements. Um, the, um, and as I said, this was then annexed into the city um, after the infrastructure was complete. Um, so the tree mitigation requirements, um, Pinellas County required a tree betterment plan, which um, the, the remaining outstanding item uh, on their, their entire mitigation plan required payment for 463 trees. And if you recall, um, when this was going through the annexation process and coming into the city, uh, there was a request um, of Pinellas County to ensure that some of that portion of that funds was spent up in Pinellas County, whatever that payment would be regarding the tree mitigation. Um, the developer continued to negotiate with Pinellas County about what that cost would be based on the per tree. Over time, after the property was actually annexed in, the county basically deferred that collection to the city. Um, and so it is for us to decide what that mitigation payment should be for those 463 trees. Um, the developer, um, who is Pioneer, they're here by the way, I'm sorry. Um, Pioneer developers, uh, under the, the county procedures, they request three estimates for the cost. Uh, they provided that their average estimated cost was 80, roughly $89 a tree. Pinellas County disagreed with that um, based on their own tree costs. Um, uh, and so there was just a continual disagreement between the county and, and developers to what that fee should be. Um, and then as I said, they ultimately have just shifted that to the city to decide. Um, the city and county you know, if we have to go out and buy trees, our per tree cost would be anywhere from 265 to 325 based on the species of tree and how many we're buying at a time. Um, so to bring this to resolution, um, we're recommending that we basically take an average of the developer cost and the city county cost of, uh, um, which would be $187, roughly $188 per tree. Um, so 463 trees at uh, that per tree cost would be just under $90,000 payment to the city for the remaining tree mitigation requirements for the project. The second um, remaining uh, issue to be decided upon is the developer's request for transportation impact fee credits. So whenever a project is developed, um, each, as each parcel, whether single family or the industrial, as each one is developed, there, we collect a transportation impact fee based on the square footage, and, and, and so that there's a, it's administered by Pinellas County, but yeah, every municipality participates. We collect the fees. Um, so the developer <coughs> expended um, a direct cost of over $380,000 
for the Brady Road construction and then the allocated costs. So that's the things like the associated stormwater, stormwater and permitting fees of another all, roughly $42,000. Um, the intersection improvements at Ann Clote Road and Eleanor Industrial Boulevard was 57500 When we were trying to get concurrence from Pinellas County on the transportation impact fee credits being requested, the county did recommend initially 100% for the intersection improvements, but they didn't recommend anything on the, um, the Brady Road construction. Uh, citing that it was the developer's design choice to construct Brady Road. This is, again, and I'll have to let Pioneer speak to this, but the, um, the developer indicated that through their design review process with Pinellas County, that they required, Pinellas County required the road to be constructed. So again, to just bring this to resolution, um, we are recommending that 50% of the direct cost only uh, be uh, approved for impact fee credits um, and the intersection improvements be uh, credited at 100%. And again, as this went along working with Pinellas County, ultimately they then took the same approach with the impact fee decision that they did with the tree mitigation and they have deferred that to the city to make that decision. So just a little bit on where we are with the impact fees. So far, uh, we've collected almost $140,000 in impact fees, uh, transportation impact fees on the project. In, 2000, in 2023 alone, we have approximately 62,000 that either has been or will be collected uh, with the projects that are, the buildings that are under construction right now. And then based on the future build out, we expect about another $300,000 um, in impact fees to be collected. So if you approve uh, the impact fee credits in the amount of 247,000, uh, it's proposed that the 2023 fees collected would be reimbursed directly. We would suggest an additional reimbursement of $30,000 from fees that have already been collected for a payment of this fiscal year of, or in total 2023 payment um, of roughly $92,000. The remaining balance will be collected as the rest of the project builds out, they'll set aside and reimburse back to the developer um, as the development happens. And when we hit the threshold where we've collected everything that's due, then the remaining fees then would just would come to the to the city. So that's the recommendation um, that so at, at a high level, just to summarize, uh, accepting a tree mitigation payment of just under $90,000 and approving transportation impact fee credits of 247,741 for the Brady Road construction and the intersection and improvements, um, an immediate payment of 92,000, the remainder to be collected from future, future fees collected. So with that, I'll stop and try to answer any questions that you might have. It's kind of- There's a considerable amount of backup that, yeah, it is. Uh, um, let me uh, go to the com uh, public, or do, do you have any comments on this, public comments? So yes, the um, multimodal impact fee is what they call this now, this uh, impact specific impact fee. And the purpose of the, of the impact fee is to construct uh, multimodal transportation projects, either specifically surrounding the project that's being built or and for lack of that, if there's not, then the, it goes to the city. They use it for whatever type of city and county, and they use it for whatever type of projects they would like to use. So in this case, very early on in our design project and design of the, excuse me if I'm a little, sound a little loopy, I've been up since midnight on a 600 yard concrete pour this morning, so I'm up 24 hours old. <laughs> so was I. Yeah, and so was <laughs> Renee, right across from her. But, um, so we, very, very early on in the discussions with Pinellas County, they told us you are gonna build Brady Road. And we also gave them some right of way. They, they uh, asked us, not asked us, they made us dedicate that as part of uh, approving the project for Brady Road. 
So it wasn't a design choice that we had that Brady was incorporated into our project as much as that was um, a project they required us to build. So therefore, we should be able to get multimodal impact fee credits for the cost of that, which were closer to the $490,000 range. I think Renee um, had a somewhat what of a summary, but the, the actual cost estimate that we turned in was a little on the height. It was uh, 479,921, including the intersection. So, you know, it was uh, over 420 some odd thousand dollars just for Brady. Um, and discussing this with the city, um, I think what the staff came up with was giving us only a portion of Brady Road and only 50% of that and then doubling, over doubling the tree mitigation fee, which we went by the county's process when we turned in um, the three estimates from nurseries for the cost of the trees. That was their process to be able to determine the cost of the trees that we were to uh, pay into their mitigation bank. But after we did exactly what they asked us to do and provided the backup, they took, they took issue with that. So. Um, in the in the in the short of it here, you know we had costs that were around eighty nine dollars a tree. The city has basically not quite doubled that, but almost to one hundred and fifty uh, one hundred fifty some odd dollars a tree. Is that what it is, Renee? Uh, times the number of trees, and we we're getting about fifty percent of less than a hundred percent of Brady Road. So that's that's the proposal on the table from the city. We're okay with it. Um, but just so you know, we're not, we're not getting our multimodal impact fee credit as we should be for the cost of Brady. It's about half of less than 100% of what we paid in for that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Stamos. There may be a question for you, but let's okay. just get past the public comments. Um, are there any public comments on this item? Uh, before I begin, uh, Ms. Marcus has kindly donated uh, two minutes of her time. Who did, Mr. Delacus? Annie Samarcus there. Ms. Ann Samarcus yes, donated two minutes for Mr. Delacus. Okay. First off, two issues trees, impact fees. I'm going to talk first a little bit about the trees. Okay. So if you take a look on your Morelli landscaping, there's eight entries there with various amounts. If you add them up, it's 2,225 divided by eight. That's 278 times 463, $128,771. That's just the average there. And as uh, Ms. Vincent said earlier, uh, those costs can be up to the 325. Let me also go back to the staff report on First page, just to really clarify, because that tree improve betterment plan kind of gives a nice little whitewash. What it was was uh, the tree betterment plan that was required by Pinellas County as mitigation for removal of over 6,000 trees on the property. And part of the reason they went to the county first is because our tree ordinance was a lot more severe. If they came for the annexation here first, they would have probably been paying quite a bit more than they're asking for now. So right off the bat, that 89,000 is insufficient. Uh, also, if you take a look uh, in the staff report uh, on the number three on page one, it even recommends uh, a tree mitigation payment range of 122,695 to 150. And my average of 128,771 by your own average from Morelli Landscaping is within that distance. So I would recommend that needs to be altered at least to somewhere between the 122,695 and the 128,771. 
That's my discussion on the tree. Now, secondly, with regards to the impact fees, let me go back to the back page here. Uh, Ms. Vincent supplied some county regulations. I'm just gonna highlight a few things quickly because I only have a couple more minutes for this section. Uh, on 150-41C, it says, uh, blah, 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 the county administrative city manager of functional equivalent may accept the offer. May, may, may. It's not required or shall, may. It's up to you to decide if you want to take an impact credit or give an impact credit reduction. Uh, also further down on number C, uh, it says, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If the county administrator, city manager, functional equivalent or their respective designees accept such an offer, not shall accept an offer, shall they accept an offer. Then on the back of that, uh, on the back it says, uh, is eligible for credit against impact fee assessment. Now, what's gonna happen, first off, let me also say this, we don't have any guarantees that it's gonna be fully billed out that you're gonna get what there's anticipated fees coming forward. Also, as you heard Thomas earlier talking about the water and sewer impact fees, are what help protect the, the city for future development. So when it's all built out and the traffic's all backed out and they need, it, need the, before it was like that left turn with only one stop sign, what are we gonna have? You're gonna have more semis going to the industrial part and the people? No, that's not gonna work. So one, <laughs> you don't have to give impact fee credits or if you decide to, you can think about how. Now, here's my last point. Earlier in the meeting, item two, Anklo River Dredge Project. City is responsible for securing a site for storage and dewatering of spoiled sediments dredged from the river. The city accomplishes by leasing a property on LNR Industrial Boulevard from Anclo Properties LLC. Who's that? Who's that? Who we've been paying for all these years, every month? How many thousand? I'd like to get a, uh, a records request to see how much we've paid in lease, and we're going to extend it now to December 2025. Who gets the money for that? Let me bring something else up. And I know it's gonna be sensitive. See this here? North Lake Trail Preliminary Plan Development. Remember this? Remember the vacation of the right of way? 20 feet given away and because of changes in the ordinance previous. No, no, it has relevance. Don't cut me off here. I'm not sure what the relevance I'm is. I'm going to, you let me finish because I only have a minute left. We only, they only paid $200 for 20 feet by 640. If you look on the property appraisers, it says 639.6 feet that distance, 20 feet. Here's where I'm gonna fill you in why. They bought that property for $630,000. Divide that by 18 lots, that's $35,000 a lot. Now you take 20 times 639.6, it's 12,792 square feet, divided by the information in here, the average lot site, 5,040. If you divide 12,792 by 5,040, it comes out to 2.538 lots times $35,000. Mr. Delacus, what's the relevance I'm, to River you're Bend? You're allowing me to get to that point. $88,833. We have already given, the city has already given them benefits. Enough of giving the developers their way. And I know Renee has to present the application as presented, but y'all have the ability to stop this nonsense. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other public comments? Um, Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? And there are no raised hands at this time. Okay. Um, let's go to commission comments. Um, does any commissioner have a question for Mr. Stamis or for staff or comments that you'd like to make in general? 
don't see any lights on. I don't. Mr. For Vice Mr. Stavis or for Renee? E either one. I'm, I'm, yeah, I have some questions for Renee. Um, I mean, obviously, we're this is another look before you annex issue, but but uh, we already talked that one to death. Yeah, uh, Vice Mayor Long, let me interrupt for a moment. We need to extend the meeting. Um, I should have done that before. I, I oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, is there a motion to extend motion the to uh, move it to Men. twelve o'clock? Second. Uh, hopefully, we'll all need it. But uh, go ahead. Point, uh, point of order. I just a point of information. I. I gave a notice last week to the city attorney and the city manager, and I informed the city clerk that I would not stay past 11 o'clock tonight. Um, I'll stay till the end of this, but then I'll be leaving, so. Is there a motion? There is a motion and a second to extend the meeting. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kalianas? Yes. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Mr. Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lund? Yes. Mayor Van Yes. Um, Vice Mayor Lund, proceed, please. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, I know they removed 6,825 trees, which is a lot. And the project deficit's 463 trees. The question I had was, if it had been annexed before they did this, would we allow that? We we have a completely different yeah I know but removal requirement and so it payment. Just never it would, would be have very flown, different. Right? It would be very different. All right, so that's it would be more. <laughs> to be blunt, it would be more. It would be more trees they'd have to replace than 463 is what you're saying, or uh, I'm just saying the payment would probably ultimately have been more. I, I you know. But. Okay. Um, okay, so the, the TIF credits, the, would they have been the same that we would have worked out if we had done them ourselves? So it, it, Yes, I mean, th this is, we're working under a countywide ordinance, so there's really no difference between the county and the city. It's just... Would we have had the same disagreements with... Probably. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, about the fact that Brady Road was, was done because... They chose not to put an internal drive in there. Oh, I mean, if we had, I, I, I don't know. I can't presuppose I mean, that how that would have turned stance, out. Right, and that seems to be when we when we go back to the county and ask them, was it your stance? Um, uh, this is what we get, but I haven't seen any hard evidence, like an email that could. Yeah, uh, it's up to you. If you'd like, Mr. Stanis. Yeah, to if you can it. reply to that. Uh, Mr. Samus, I appreciate it. Sure. I, I'll just say this, that we've done quite a few projects in the city and elsewhere, and they always require you to develop the road, a, a paper street that you're abut. It's just a requirement. And I think it's the same in the city as well as the county. The first thing that we, that we were told when we went in there is you're going to build Brady Road. I mean, it's a paper street adjacent to the boundary of a project that we're going to develop, and it has a, a, a use and a benefit. And I don't know that the uh, there was an aerial up earlier that shows that roadway not only abutted our project, but it abuts another 20 acres right across from us that's going to be annexed into the city at some point. It's a vacant piece of property about 20 acres right to the north of us. They made us put Brady Road in. And if we were doing that in the city, they would have made us put Brady yeah, Road okay. in. I, I, I mean, I realize that I'm just working through the backup material. Yeah, I know, but I'm just, so. just from experience, it, they're going to make you put they're going to make you put in a street that abuts the boundary of your property if it has a use, and it provides a transportation element, which it does. It provides a transportation element to our property, to the property to the north of us, to the work release center right there just past it, on further on down all the way to the Anclote, um, the Anclote Superfund site, if you will, I guess is the best way to put it. It, takes, it goes all the way straight, all the way down to west to the, to the river. I understand, I drove yeah. the area. Okay, that's, that's all I wanted to say. There, there were um, put that so there was another question I had and I need to pull up the exact place. Somewhere in here, there was a, 
a, a determination that 25% of the allocated cost should be paid by the city. And I'm trying to find out exactly where that determination was made. But um, do you know offhand who came up with that 25%? I think it was 20. I'm at a loss as to where you are. I'm sorry. 5.1. I'm sorry. I should have printed out the whole thing, but I was being cheap. Okay, I can't find where that refers to, so forget that comment. Um, if I find it, I'll bring it up later. Um, okay, so the road does help um, circulation, traffic circulation in the area. It's not exactly what I would call multimodal, so it doesn't quite fit the bill, but um, it, it's a road that's going to accrue traffic circulation. Um, there is a public benefit from opening up the area. It's going to create more employment, et cetera. Um, I don't know how we determine the amount of public benefit. Um, I don't know how we arrived at 50% of the road costs. Could you explain that? It, really just looking at the fact that uh, to what uh, Mr. Stamis brought about, you know, spoke about, you know, they, they footed the bill 100% to put this road in. There's another property owner over here that's going to get the full benefit of that. So we're looking for giving them at least a 50% credit back for that Brady Road piece. Oh, okay. They're, uh, they're, they don't have to do stormwater for the road. They don't have to do, the, the, when that property develops, and it will develop, it may not be next year or a year, you know, but uh, so, understand. yeah. Okay, so there were some other, yeah, actually, no, that's not true. I'm fine, I'm okay. through with questions, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Commissioner Prias. <clears throat> unless some of you can, unless someone on the board has any ideas about credits, impacts, uh, I'm willing to go with the staff recommendation and get this put through, uh, push it through. Uh, we didn't, this wasn't a, a development majority of us were on the board. A lot of this stuff has been going in between back and forth. And um, unless someone makes some recommendations, I'm willing to go with uh, staff's recommendations and uh, move this okay. forward. Thank um, you. I, I just have um, one question. If uh, Commissioner Kuyas is, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay, Ms. Vincent, how long have everybody been working on this particular item? About, well, it's it's been a pending issue for about three years. Three years? Yes. Okay. That might help. So, Commissioner Eisner. I agree with what uh, Commissioner Cooley has just said. Unless there's a issue on price or whatnot, I want to go ahead with your recommendation. Okay. Um, is there a motion and a second? This is for item nine, River Bend Tree Mitigation Transportation Impact Fees. Motion to fees. approve the River Bend Tree Mitigation and Transportation Impact Fees. Second. Okay, if there's no further comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Kulianis? Yes. Commissioner Kuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatican? Yes. Um, okay, item 10, Habitat for Humanity request to reduce liens on donated land and purchase of city owned lots. Mayor. Um, Mayor Vincent. I mean, Commissioner Kulianis. It's it's up to him. I mean, I I have no control over what Mr. Kulianis just, does. I know. I mean, we still have a couple items. I mean, your input could be helpful, and I mean, I didn't see this 11 o'clock p.m. thing <laughs> come across. So I, I'd ask if you could just stay here. We'll get it done, and then maybe I mean, we could address it. At another time? I requested this over a week ago that I, I needed to leave at 11 o'clock. Just okay. I, I, I can get into my reasons. I'm not asking for approval. I asked, 
I, I put in for the, to the city attorney and you told me that that was appropriate, correct? Yes, um, he can leave. Um, you still have a quorum to conduct business. Is this, uh, uh, every week or would, whatever Commissioner Koulianis does, he's, it's, he's, he's his own man. He's his own person, I should say. I, we can't control, this is what he wants to do. There's no hard requirement for somebody to stay here. It's just, I, I don't even know if we note it for the record, but in any case, um, that, that's, is, is, is my correct? I mean, that's well, as far as it goes, is that we, right? We need, we need some enlightenment. Is this, was this considered to be something every regular session meeting or just? One time. This okay, is, this that's fine. This is just, he, for Absolutely. his obligations Absolutely. that he We has. still have quorum. Yeah. You do still have oh, quorum. That's the key. Yes. That's the key. Okay. The, quorum. the quorum is Thank what's you. important for the conduct of your business. Um, Where was I? Uh, ha the Habitat of Humanity, uh, Habitat for Humanity requests reduce liens on donated land purchases of city-owned lots. Ms. Vincent. Yeah, let, let, me, let me start, because I have Ms. Vincent was good enough to help me with this. Um, this is really looking for direction and approval to go forward. It's really two things in this. One, one piece of property, it's about three pieces of property. One piece of property um, is owned by Habitat now, but had liens on it. In this property, I found out this was someone who bought this property in the <coughs> Union Academy neighborhood at a tax sale. So they came into our town, got a tax sale, and I don't know the number, but it was an outrageous number they were gonna try to sell the property to the Habitat for Humanity. I told them to hold off, I'll just foreclose on it, and it'll become a city property, and then we'll negotiate it. Well, when the people heard that, they just, signed it over and decided to donate it to Habitat. So, so w without saving us and the attorney the money of, of foreclosing on it moving forward and them coming into town just on a tax sale and trying to make money off the Union Academy neighborhood, they did the right thing and donated to Habitat. Um, so the one issue is just, it, is just coming around. It was a high amount of liens as you see on there, but we're kind of acquainted with the other two pieces of property, the one on Harrison and the one on Groves. Um, we kind of equated to about $25,000 per property. We had, the, we had an offer on there for 50,000 for the Harrison Street lots. The Groves just became available. So I'll let her go, I'll let the, Renee, cause she was the one to help us put all this together, get all these figures here, just to go briefly through these and uh, to see what your direction is on moving forward. Um, with the reduction of liens um, to give them the property they own and the possibility of selling the other two properties for them um, for, how, for housing neighborhood. And they, they did assure me when we were talking to them about this thing that they would, they would attempt to place Union Academy people on the list into these properties. And we can kind of confirm, confirm this when we finalize it, but that was the kind of thing I looked for them, especially on the Harrison Street lots and stuff. But Renee, would you just go in real, real briefly what you looked at on those three properties. So uh, again, I, I think you covered the Lime Street a uh, lot pretty well. Um, there are, I didn't add these up, but in excess of $60,000, $65,000 of code enforcement liens and lot mowing abatement um, liens on the, um, the, the Lime Street lot. So we're recommending that that be reduced to um, $25,000 which is really consistent with like what Habitat has been paying for generally for a lot to, to, you know, to build on. For, for the 433 East Harrison Street, um, this, uh, there are no, the only, the only hard costs that we can find associated with our demolition cost of $4,255. Uh, um, Habitat has offered 50,000 for this property. Um, it will be for two lot, two buildable lots. So 20, again, $25,000 for each buildable lot for them. So a total of $50,000 uh, to purchase those lots from the city. And then the 127 North Gross Avenue. On this, we have the, the utility liens um, cannot, be, um, cannot be waived. The total cost for 
the utility liens, lot mowing, and demolition costs for that property is a little over 25000 So again, to, to make the city whole on that, we're asking for a sale price of 26000 to basically offset those costs. So I'll stop there and did I cover everything, city manager? Yeah. All right. Okay. Are there uh, any public comments on this item? Um, Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? And there are no raised hands at this time. Okay. Uh, public questions. I'm, I'm sorry. Commissioner questions, comments. Yeah, I do actually. I can see where they look at me. He's going, what is he going to come up with now? Um, so the Harrison street property, mm -hmm. do you know that it's platted for 50 foot lots? It, it is, but it's a portion of there. The, the piece that there are three lots, but the portion that we own is a is a southerly piece of it. There, so there's it's been it's been future sub at some point somebody subdivided it. Oh, so okay. yes, yeah, so so there's enough lot area there really for two single family homes. Oh yeah, that explains. Guy looked at it and went, you get three out of this. Why are they only going for two? Anyway, the, I'm fine. The finance with this. director called that to my attention as well earlier today. So actually, he had. Unbeknowingly, prep me for that question. <laughs> Thank you. No further questions. Okay. Uh, any other commissioner comments? Um, Ms. Vince, I just want to verify the uh, request of the cost or um, what the 25000 equivalent for each of the lots that's mm -hmm. acceptable to the Habitat for Humanity. I'll have to defer that to okay. Mr. Rush. I'm <laughs> you, we, we knew night. we'd get you out of the You knew I'd get out of the so. chair if I could just get up. Uh, Ken Rush, COO at Habitat for Humanity. First of all, thank you all for having this evening and, and taking the time to hear our little bit here. Yes, we are perfectly in agreement okay. for 25000 per lot and to also cover the full cost of the one where we have the utility liens. We know it's over twenty five, but yes. Um, it was a gracious process. We were in a long conversation on Lime Street for several months with the actual owner who was not willing to give at all. So we kind of just backed off and said, well, if you're not willing to at least meet us some portion, we'd just walk away. I think he finally got the best of maybe his conscience got to him. He was willing to donate the property. So we felt it was only fair that we would actually try to at least assume some of those liens that have been on that property for so long. So the reality of it is we've got several houses under construction right now. We've got five in planning with the city right now. These four right now will, will take us to another level. You know, I've been here long enough to know that we haven't done a lot of work in Tarpon Springs since I've been with Habitat for 17 years, but to see us get into the 10 and 12 and even 15 mark just for one year is really exciting. And we have people that really want to live here. So thank you. And yeah, we always thank you for everything that you do for the community. Thank you. All right. Um, if, if there's no further commission comments, may I have a motion and a second? Oh, you have comments, Commissioner Cuyo? Yeah, I'd like to uh, I'd like to consider a higher price for these properties. Some of these are corner lots. I understand there's a... Uh, is, is your mic on? Can you put your microphone? Thank yeah, you. I'd like to ask for uh, a higher price and, and what's being recommended here. I mean, some of these properties, they're, you know, there, there's fines up here, and these are being donated for a good cause for affordable housing, and uh, property's not cheap in Tarpon Springs, and uh, there's some corner lots, and I would, I would ask to ask at least that five thousand dollars to each property that we see here. That's four properties, so we're building affordable housing. We're we're doing a good thing. They're doing a good thing, but there's those fines out there that you know we went up on people before and, and this is a an organization that can help do a good thing but property is scar scarce in Tarpon Springs and so these are ready to go and I think those amounts are too low personally um, is it, uh, I'm sorry uh, Commissioner Cuya, did you have anything else no, uh, not at this time okay Commissioner Eisner <sighs> My comment is to keep it the way it is. Um, we'll be making tax money off of these um, homes once they're built. I, I guess my point is on all of this, uh, we're ready for a motion in a second. You can make whatever motion you want and, and, and ask for a second. 
I'll make a motion to add five thousand dollars to zero Lime Street, so a total reduced liens to thirty thousand um, dollars. Also, to include the sale price of sixty thousand dollars for four three three East Harrison Street, and to establish the sale price of thirty one thousand dollars for one twenty seven North Gross. Okay. Is there a uh, second to that motion? Second? Okay, it, the motion dies for lack of second. Now, is there another motion? Motion to approve it the way it is. Is there a motion uh, second to that? Second. Okay, if there's no further commission no, comment. No, no, Mayor, I got comments. I mean, what we're doing here, we got some prime real estate, all right? We're giving it very cheap, and I appreciate what Habitat for Humanity does, but we've gone out of our way to settle code enforcement fines that are hundreds of thousands of dollars for an organization that's, they get well-funded, but yet we see individuals in which we punish. We actually increase prices on recommendations. So we're giving up prime property for affordable housing to Whoever applies to their organization, which is fine, that $5,000 per property isn't that much of a difference. And I don't like, I just don't like the deal. I think the, there's way more money out there. And basically, and that's why, you know, moving forward, I, I don't go to volunteer to some of these organizations. So I don't feel the complexion of me feel like I'm doing something because I want to be able to say no when I need to and not have that compelling feeling that I'm helping out Habitat for Humanity or any other organization. But those are good properties. We could sell them for more if we wanted to. But what do we do? We end up losing the, we end up risking the chance of selling to somebody who's going to build a four or $500,000 house and maybe push out some people from that neighborhood. So it's give or take either way, but it's too cheap right here. It's too cheap that we're offering. And so uh, I see that we're willing to break our backs for organizations, but for the citizens, we don't do it. And that's why I always stand strong for the citizens when it comes to complying with code enforcement stuff, and I will continue to do so. So I don't, I don't like this deal at all. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Creo. Um, Commissioner Asher, your light's back on. I can appreciate what, he, what Commissioner Kula said, but um, you you... When you have private citizens having to come into compliance, they're the ones creating the violation. When Habitat Humanity, they're taking over violations that they didn't create, somebody else created them. So I'm gonna go and motion to approve it just the way it is. Okay, I, I, I think we have a motion in a second already. We do Chris have Mayor, a motion in a second. Say something? I have a comment though. Um, I don't care how we get there. We need to provide more affordable housing in Tarpon Springs. To me, $20,000 out of our $70 million budget is gonna make or break anything. We're gonna provide four homes, or Habitat for Humanity is gonna provide four homes for people that need affordable housing, and they're responsible, and we know they go through this whole thing, and I'm not gonna give you the whole Habitat for Humanity pitch, uh, but you know, these properties which are not, you know, being taxed right now, or not collecting tax on them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are just gonna sit there and fallow. And and I so I just kind of wanted to say that, you know, however we offer affordable housing to people in Tarpon Springs, and I think Habitat has stated that they're gonna try to reach out to local Tarpon Springs residents and local Tarpon Springs people that that work within Tarpon Springs, et cetera, as part of this whole thing is is just perfectly what we need to do. Yeah, yeah and, your and light's still on. I, yeah. I would reiterate that we saw time and time again, everyday citizens who, or even businesses who bought properties have to sit there and deal with the, the code enforcement issues of the, of the previous property owner, which some of this board had no problem going along and, and putting that burden on them. So. Like I said, these are good properties. It's affordable housing is good, but um, I'm hoping it's the locals that are getting the affordable housing. Um, they have their program and that's great, but just because they're, they're getting rewarded 
when other times we don't reward people or give the same breaks. And those are everyday people who, whether they cause it themselves or their parents cause it themselves, you know, we still made them pay some severe fines. So they're getting away with a very good deal. And it's just, I don't see it, so. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kouyas? No. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vadikaris? Yes. Um, item 11, Settlement of Code Enforcement Lien 44098, U.S. Highway 19, um, McClemens. I believe the chief and the attorney worked on that one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Ms. Kardash. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I have my memorandum in the packet in the backup materials that gives a little brief history of the case um, and the settlement offer um, that the city received from uh, the property owner. Uh, that's kind of outlined there. I also outlined in the memorandum the options that you have with respect to the amount of the fine. Um, I do know that the total payoff of, of the fine uh, that is listed in there it was good until September 30th. Um, the amount that they're offering is, is less than that. It's that $5,500 figure. Um, it, and if you're going to consider accepting that from the property owner, I would request that you put a time frame in your motion. Um, I think anywhere from, from 60 to 90 days is reasonable. Um, I did uh, speak with the uh, property owner's uh, counsel, their legal counsel, um, and uh, they did uh, represent to me that if you did approve this, it would be paid immediately. Um, but even with that, I still want the time frame on the motion if you're going to accept it. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me go to public comments. Are there any public comments on this item? Mr. Chump or Ms. DeRacy's, are there any remote access comments? And there are no raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, commissioner comments, um, any comments on this item? Commissioner Eisner. <clears throat> um, I'm not willing to accept the 55. I would accept the uh, fine amount of 28.8. Uh, Commissioner Cuyas, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Cuyas. That, that's 2,800. 28,800. It's the fine amount. If, if you look at the uh, clerk's breakdown of uh, the costs and what they are all allocated to, the principal of the fine um, is $28,800. So just to clarify, we just saw three properties with over, some of them over 60 to $100,000 in fines. Uh, we gave a 75% reduction on some of them because, because of the organization involved. And yet we want to not accept the offer and just, you know, make our fine costs and our fine amount. It looks terrible on all levels. And that's why we're not consistent enough when it comes to this code enforcement stuff. And we all have our, our, our little ego trips whenever we want to. So I have nothing further to say. Okay, Vice Mayor Lund. So do we know when this was brought back into compliance? That's part of the issue that was um, discussed with um, the applicant and the applicant's attorney. They actually had brought the property back into compliance, um, but allegedly were unaware that they had to call for a reinspection. Um, so it was a significant amount of time from when the fine was actually imposed um, until the property was uh, and and then corrected and then reinspected. I understand for compliance. that did they state. I know they hired a property uh, a maintenance, maintenance correct, company, correct. And, but did they state when it was brought back into compliance, or they just? Kind of, no, no, it went back into compliance. Um, it ran for a total of 142 days. Uh, let's 
so from that's I mean that's I don't have I don't have in the materials uh, yeah, the date was, that it was actually closed. There was some closed, stuff in was, the back up here that was right. So they they missed. actually re when they received the notice is when they realized that um, from your your previous code oh, enforcement yeah, so officer. The, that's the notice that's in the back up is the date. That's when that's they correct. realized they needed the reinspection okay, to so, stop the fine. Um, and just to to. To do a comparison, I believe the McClemens are the ones that are trying to, uh, they came to us for some changes to their property this on US 19 because they wanted to develop it and seeing that they can't develop it now, they're trying to clear things to, uh, to in order to be able to sell that property. And it's kind of at the entrance to Tarpon Springs. But um, just comments. My belief is that we should take the total due. We should take the total due, not their not their offer. That would be the twenty eight thousand. No, that would be thirty five thousand six hundred and thirty eight dollars and ninety nine cents. I see the total due. I follow you. Okay. Um, okay, and um, we've had well. That was your light. Commissioner Kuya, your light's still on. Did you Yeah, have to I just think it's amazing. We're, we're punishing these people because of a gathering place for homeless people in which, how often can you sit there and monitor their properties and, and tell, you know, when there's homeless people on there? I mean, we got, we got people who need to walk across our streets all day. You know, they, they lounge around, but yet, we're going to pick on this property, okay? One, but one because they're a developer or w whatever it is, as someone had to bring it up for some reason. I don't know why. We give breaks to these organizations that have plenty of funds. Then we go about picking on them for $30,000 because there's homeless sitting on their property when our city has the same issues, and yet we're going to go after them for the full amount. That is embarrassing when you guys aren't that consistent. You just saw from the previous, you guys bent your back for them, and now you wanna charge this property, one, because what, they have a good property? What, two, because they, they had homeless there? You guys can't even control homeless walking on your own properties. And, and so it's, it's sad to see you guys inconsistent with code enforcement, not have any empathy for people, and on top of it, not take advantage of opportunities when well-funded organizations come in and we, we break our backs for them. So another point proven. Point of order. No, there's no point of order. Hang on. I'm not done speaking. I'm gonna ask both And there's of you nothing you. wrong. Just, just stop I'm for out. a minute. Just stop. Um, Commissioner Kulia, if you can just finish your comments with a little less. Um, it's embarrassing emotion, the hypocrisy but... we see, Mayor. We see it nonstop, it's inconsistent, and it's embarrassing. Just go look back at the last thing. Uh, and then look what we do now. What, because you couldn't control some homeless sleeping on, on the property? We can't do that in half the properties that are okay. our property owners that we can't reach out to. <clears throat> and, and so what, we're gonna charge this property $30,000? And, you know, we had to bring up, oh, this is the people want to develop. What is that, a punishment? So I just don't get it. I, I don't get where you guys think at times about your ability to think about power and control things. And it's just disappointing. It, it's really disappointing. There's an opportunity to, to, to give a break to somebody. And then on top of it, you want to charge them the full amount. But yet previously, you just gave this organization, you just saved them almost $200,000. What, in the name of affordable housing? So what, if they wanna go build and put affordable housing there, we'd give them a break? Okay. Inconsistent, and it's hypocrisy. And it's embarrassing for our city. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna say anything, Ms. Kardash. Yes, sir. What I'm going to ask the commission is to defer this item okay. so that some of them can have some conversation with you about this so we can come a little closer to what a fine amount would be. 
Um, we haven't had a motion right now, and so I'm asking just to defer this item for two weeks. I, I would request that as well because um, given my conversations with counsel for the property owner, um, they would want to be here to address some of your concerns. That would be okay. helpful. That would be helpful. Okay. May, may I have a motion? Yeah, I'm asking for a motion to defer this item for two weeks. Did you want to? Let's I make, make the make motion. One comment. No, no. Not regarding Commissioner Kulas. I want to read to you one thing. Um, the property owner claims she was only recently notified of the total amount owed. She's been notified through this whole thing. It's been ignored. So is Habitat for Humanity. Okay, Very let's <laughs> let's stop the discussion. I, I don't want to get into... Come Motion to table for this item until two weeks. Just defer the item for two weeks. Motion to defer this item until two weeks. And, and I don't mean to cut you off, but did you have anything else to say about that? If, is there a second and then we can go to... The second. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Eisen, would you like to finish? I don't want to sit here. I, we're all allowed a different opinion or decision but we have one commissioner who keeps going to rip into other people's opinions decisions thoughts actions and i don't appreciate that i don't respect someone who's going to uh, override what i think is right just because he's a bully and he thinks he's right okay so, why don't we call okay. the question thank you and and then um and then put this item behind us i do have some comments they're constructive, but I don't want to, if yeah. we deferred it, I can say for next week. And this will give everyone, including Commissioner Koulianis, an opportunity if he needs information to speak to Ms. Kardash about it. So if, if without any further uh, comments, I'd like to ask for roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Heisner? No. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. All right, the last item, let me get ready here. Um, this is something that, um, it, it's the um, last item is to remove from table and schedule building department internal audit. Um, this is something that I asked to put here, uh, put on here. And um, what I'm gonna ask, um, since I'm the one who put it on here to withdraw the item from the agenda, um, Basically, what that in effect would do, uh, it would be a motion to withdraw. That what in effect that would do would not change the status of it of a tabling. And and I do have some additional comments, but I'd like to, um, uh, not the motion right now, but Ms. Kardash, if you'd like to, do you have any comments that you'd like to say? If not, then we can continue on. Not at this time, but if there's any questions. Okay. Um, let me go to public comment. Are there any public comments on this item? Here to the lack is 514 Ashland Avenue. And uh, something that came up in the last meeting and uh, maybe the mayor will comment about it, but uh, residency, city manager, assistant city manager, city clerk, administrative services director, fire chief, police chief, Public Service Director, Development Services Director, and Planning and Zoning Director shall establish permanent legal residency within the city within one year after appointment. Now, why do I bring this up? I had texted a couple of y'all that the Development Services Director actually in function is the Building Services Director. Now, I called in, I spoke to Ms. Niffen, and she mentioned she spoke to the mayor because he had questions. So when I was on the board, again, I left in 2010, but the building department was the development services. So Joey was the development services director and also the building director. And then from what Ms. Niffen relayed to me around 2014, there was some restructuring of jobs and so public services, public works, Tom, Paul, Renee, they all got split off, three set, but somehow the building department head didn't get included, still left the development services director on there. 
Same thing, you can confirm that there's no administrative services director also in our job descriptions. But technically, the building development director are one and the same. So if, in my impression, and again, there's legalities and technicalities with labor laws about job descriptions and all that, but to my impression, Mr. Powell should have been required to live here, and if he couldn't accommodate that, then we should have moved on earlier on towards another building director. But I just wanted to bring that out into the public because that was an issue that was discussed a lot. As far as tabling or moving it, uh, I think we learned a lot of things that I know in my mind changed some my attitude and maybe my perception of how stuff was because of what I only read as compared to what I heard. So I, I think there needs maybe to be some flushing out, uh, but I just had to bring that out about that kind of institutional knowledge. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other public comments? Mr. Racy's, are there any remote access comments? And there are no raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask for that motion now before um, I, I'm going to give my comments because I want to explain how we got to this point from where we were two weeks ago. Um, is there a motion to withdraw the item? Do you want a certain date or just withdraw no, the no, item? No, it, it would be just up to, um, I'm now. going to explain that, Ms. Jackson to do what she needs to do mm -hmm. and then that would be determined to bring it back to a specific date. It, by the way, before I get into it, the, the audit is not going away. The yeah. audit will be presented. So I just want to make sure. that clear. Um, is there a motion to withdraw this item and that would keep the item oh. tabled? Motion to withdraw special consent agenda item 12. Okay. Second. Second, okay. Uh, now I'm gonna go to comments. I'd like to say something. Um, just so you all know how this whole matter progressed um, at the because I've been involved in it too um, at the end of the last meeting agenda um, concerning the audit the internal auditor was asked to have the report reviewed by the uh, personnel attorney which he did I mean we that was basically our direction to him and he did he contacted Ms. Jackson and asked her to review it Ms. Jackson um, reviewed it. Um, then um, I was asked to meet with Ms. Jackson and Ms. Kardash uh, on the internal auditor report. Um, the three of us um, met. The purpose of the meeting was to get my thoughts on who should review the report, um, who the report should go to since our attorneys work for the uh, municipal corporation and not any person. So um, Ms. Jackson was asked to review it. She reviewed it, she formed an opinion, and then she wanted to know who she, she make a report to. And so that, um, I believe at that time during the meeting, we had a fairly uh, thorough in discussion on the matters um, concerning the internal audit report and uh, with, and, um, that are also outlined in the, the memorandum that Ms. Kardash provided you, and there were other items uh, discussed as well that, that are associated with it. Um, the approach tonight um, that Ms. Kardash with this motion to withdraw um, is a little different than what uh, the, th the three of us had discussed. Uh, at, at least it was, it was my understanding that it was different. But then um, I was only asked for my thoughts. I wasn't asked for direction to provide the attorney's direction as in that, quite frankly, as it should be. The, the attorneys work for the municipal corporation. They obtain direction from the commission as a deliberative body, not any one individual. Um, at face value, this particular item seems like um, you know, it's about the internal auditor, but it's not. It's about the uh, um, 
the entire matter. Uh, this is just the first step. Um, what, what it'll do is give Ms. Jackson time to uh, complete her report and also um, make her report to the commission. I, I, I'm not sure how she would transmit it, maybe by email, maybe by some other way. Maybe she would want an agenda item. I don't know. We haven't got to that point, but that's her call. And, um, and so um, I, for me, I, in talking to Ms. Kardashian and Ms. Jackson, I, I see this as a learning experience. Um, I think we've all wanted um, some um, more formality to what we do, procedures that we should all follow, and that applies to all of us. Um, based on my discussion with the attorneys, um, the, the rules do apply to everyone equally, and I'm going to uh, hold them to that, and I believe um, you would expect nothing less as well. Also, for full disclosure, I mentioned that I've, I've met with Mr. Poulos, and I want to make it clear that I meet with Mr. Poulos every three weeks. That's a scheduled meeting, and, and I feel it's important. <coughs> and not, not only with Mr. Poulos, I meet with Ms. Jacobs, I meet with the city manager, and I have conversations with Ms. Kardash, on a, not on any schedule, but routinely. Um, and so I... I um, I, I meet with Mr. Poulos every, uh, every three weeks and any time he feels it's needed. Um, I did meet with Mr. Poulos um, today, uh, again, just before the meeting with Ms. Kardash. Um, so I do keep up with um, Mr. Poulos on these items. The last point, the last point I wanna make is that prior to even the report of the conduct, uh, I'm sorry, of the audit, uh, the audit report, I had some concerns about uh, employee relations and also um, labor laws. And, and obviously, as a mayor commissioner, this is not my purview, except that involve matters at the commission level as well. And similar to formalizing the audit process, which I'm hoping Ms. Jackson is going to help us with and, and kind of teach us everything as well as, as, well as our internal auditor, um, I'm, I'm hoping that's going to be the case, um, that we should learn more about dealing with the uh, public employees. And that's not any different than the uh, Sunshine Law, public records, and the ethics training that we had earlier, um, I, I'm hope, I want to say this year. Correct. So, um, and that's consistent with that. We haven't had any uh, training on that. So, um, you know, on that point, I expressed my observations to Ms. Kardash, and she referred me to Ms. Jackson. Both agreed training uh, would help, and I also briefly talked to uh, the city manager, and the training would not just include uh, the commission and the charter officials, but also the department heads as well. I think we had that conversation and that's um, both I, agreed. I would to. like to point out though that in discussion with Ms. Jackson, she was looking to do the commission training separate from the department heads. Okay. So ju right. just that, for your that's information. Fine. I just, okay. is that, that's fine. Um, and, and so whatever, um, as far as labor laws and things that may be related to this building audit, uh, building department audit, it would be wrapped up into that as well. And um, there may be some other thoughts that Ms. Jackson comes up with, but that's all I wanted to explain to you all tonight, how this came about. It wasn't because of something somebody saw that talked to Ms. Jackson. It was actually the commission asking, requesting, giving direction to the internal auditor to have his report reviewed by Ms. Jackson, which he did. And then this is Ms. Jackson not wanting to work directly with the internal auditor, but to actually you know, because she works with a municipal corporation to make her report to the commission. So that's where we are. And because of that, to give her enough time, that's why we're, um, uh, I'm requesting to withdraw the item tonight that I actually brought forward. And, um, and again, the audit is not going away. It's just this first step in working our way through this whole thing, the, the, uh, letting Mr. Poulos finish his report, hopefully accepting the report, and then going forward, at least that's that's my hope, uh, which is a very you know it's a strong word, but we'll see how it goes. I I want to um, 
ask the commissioners if, if any of you have any questions concerning this. I don't have a question, I have a statement. I would just like to do um, the proper protocol of whatever the city um, dictates um, with the audit or with how we're gonna handle this. Um, this is the attorney's recommendation. Right, okay. I understand that, so, yeah. I understand that. Are there any other comments? No, nope. okay. Ms. Kardash, did you wanna add anything? No, sir. Okay, uh, if there's no further comments, roll call please. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay, where are we in everything? <laughs> Does that, oh, we have a, um, an addendum. Uh, we have a request for a shade meeting. Um, Ms. Kardash, I'm gonna turn that over to you. Yes, that request came in late Thursday after your agenda was already published. So um, I went ahead and drafted it. It is a new settlement offer um, that they came back with following your decision um, in the last shade meeting. Okay, and, and the date, oh, there's no date yet. Right? I don't have a date. Okay. I, I, I sent to you, uh, getting with Mrs. Salzman, of course, there's some scheduled conflicts uh, for 545 on October 12th. Yeah, that's what I have. Oh, this is for another shade meeting? Yes. And there's no time before, the, there's conflicts before that, that, that these, that's the available date to. And, and that's estimated for a one hour meeting. Mm -hmm. When we yes. say about one hour, there's some wiggle room in that, is that correct? Um, a little bit, but it really shouldn't be too much. Could, and I, you my, can, you we can, were pressed last time to finish what we had to do. So um, if you want to make it for two hours to make sure you have enough time, you can do that. Um, and when you notice it, just put that you, that you believe the anticipated length of the meeting will be two hours, not one. Okay, and we can end shorter if we had to. You can't. We just can't go way It's better not to go it. over, but um, okay. yes, there's no problem is, with ending is, sooner. Is, I, I think that would be okay with the commissioner, so okay. Um, I didn't hear that whole thing. I, I basically, we, we, at our last shade meeting, we are pressed to finish within the time allotted. And I asked Ms. Kardash whether there's some wiggle room in the estimated time that we give. And she said a little bit, but not much. Um, she recommended that if we needed more time, we could make it two hours and that would be acceptable to go two hours. And if we finished early, we can finish early, but the going in the opposite direction is not good. So are you suggesting this Thursday, the 12th meeting should be two hours? 5.45 to no later than, I don't think it's gonna go two hours, but it, we needed more time. You know how busy the schedule is? On that particular day, <coughs> there's a police department swearing in, there's a fundraising dinner for Why Trill, not? there's all sorts of stuff going on with the right. PD that day. And this well, hopefully takes we, out the whole thing. I, I'm hoping that we can get it done. We can leave it at one hour. That's not an issue with me. I just want to make sure you know that we need to finish in an hour. Well, we can't get into these. 5.45 to 6.45 at Lowe's events. That's fine. Day. As long as we all recognize what Ms. Kardash just said. That's all. Yes. Okay. I recognize right. what you said. I, um, may I have a motion? Ms. Jacobs will keep it as it was for one hour. We have a motion to schedule the shade meeting. Is that correct, Ms. Kardash? To schedule the shade yes, meeting at correct. October 12th at 5.45 p.m. Yes. At the, um, we don't need to, it's in the audit, the um, conference room at the end of the hall. We have a motion to that effect. So moved. Okay, is there a second? Thank you, Commissioner Eisner. Second. Okay, if there's no further comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? No. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, the, uh, before we go to board and staff comments, um, I'd like to uh, ask for a motion to excuse Ms. Kardash from the October 7th uh, Board of Commissioners meeting. Um, I, I know she, says that she could show up late, but I think the same kind of logic that um, it'd be better to excuse you from the meeting. And if you do want to come and, and help, 
Yes, Commissioner Eisen. I think you might have said October and it's November. You're talking about No, that. it's October 17th. Oh, 17th. I heard October yeah, 7th. No, I'm sorry. No, it's October it's That's October the next 17th. meeting, right? October 17th. Yeah. So it would be October 17th to excuse Ms. Kardash from the meeting. If she wishes to join the meeting late, um, that would be at her discretion. So may I have a motion to that effect to excuse Ms. Kardash Moved. from the... Did so you moved. make that motion? Yes. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there any commission comments on that? I, public comments? Okay. Are we going to replace her with somebody? <laughs> so, all right. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Cuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vaticiotis? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's go to, uh, we've got eight minutes. Let's go to board staff comments. Um, Chief Young. No comments, sir. It's a good one. Ms. Kardash. No comments. Okay. Let's see, Manager LaCourse. No comments. Uh, Ms. Jacobs. I have no comments. Thank okay. You. Uh, Vice Mayor Lund. No, no comment. Okay, um, Commissioner Eisner. Yes, I am going to be at the Schools Transportation Safety Board tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Okay. Get those lights, Mike. <laughs> That's well, good. Truthfully, they didn't have the lights on the agenda, which they promised me for the last three meetings. So we sent the letter there, you know, when it's, it just came in yesterday as they finally decided to put the solar lights for the bus stops on the agenda. Oh, wow. Now, I don't believe that they have very much many facts on it because it was just put on yesterday. <laughs> but, um, you know, and all I'm asking for is a price, you know, to keep the kids safe, you know, that's a, it's, it's nothing serious. It's only gonna take one <laughs> kid getting hit. Yeah. It's like, you know, how many kids do you have to have run over by a car before you'll change your thinking, you know, and light them up, you know, so that you can see they're there, but that's it. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Krios. Uh, yes, tomorrow I was invited by a colleague um, who's in uh, partners and networking, and uh, he invited me just to be a guest speaker as a, as a commissioner. I'm not going there to speak on any position for the city at all, just uh, try to talk about, you know, just municipal government and the importance in trying to help out your community. So I just wanted to give you guys a, a heads up and um, be aware of it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would also like to, uh, um, it's my turn, I would also like to uh, um, congratulate Ms. Kardash on her recognition by Indian, um, Indian Rocks, in, in Indian Shores uh, City Commission Thank for you. helping the police department get their accreditation. And also with, uh, Major Ruggiero was a, in, instrumental as that as well in, yes. in that. So I, uh, congratulations to everyone on that. That's the reason why Ms. Kardashian won't be here October mm -hmm. 17th. Um, the other thing is, um, I, did I miss something? I, I, I know, you know, Commissioner Kuliana said he, he told people about leaving tonight, but I didn't see a, a memo, nor that, that I needed to see a memo, but it would have been nice so that there wouldn't be any misunderstanding of what Mr. Kulianis was doing to at least share that with us. Um, I, I don't know who is. I heard him talk about it. I never saw a memo. Okay. When did he talk about it? He talked about having to leave at 11 o'clock. He was pissed because we stayed <laughs> to 2 o'clock. Oh, I know tonight, but beforehand, he spoke to somebody. Yeah, he, uh, he had called me and asked um, if, if uh, the meeting went past 11, if that? he was required that's, to stay. And, and I told him that the answer to that was essentially yeah, no. And, and just so everybody, that's, that's absolutely fine. He, he could just, you know, I, I'm saying this in a very positive way. If a commissioner's got another obligation or there's a need for him, for whatever reason, a family emergency or anything like that, uh, I mean, they don't need to do anything. They can just get up and leave or whisper to, Chief Young, for that matter, on their way out, or, or Ms. Jacobs at the other end, just to let them know in case somebody asks later what it's about. So um, in this particular case, I, I, I know what maybe some of the issues were, but I think in, this was just a one-time. It was just yeah, a one-time okay. thing. Yes. All right, so it, this applies to everybody. So I think it only makes a difference if we break quorum, right? Yeah, so if you break quorum, you gotta if, stop your meeting. If two more people <laughs> to go up, then the meeting's over. If right? you have three commissioners walk out, <laughs> that's the end of the meeting. 
two. We need three is a quorum. Is that three correct? Three is a quorum. Three is a quorum. Yeah. All right. Uh, meeting adjourned at eleven fifty-seven. Thank you, Mayor. Can we just make sure the one ordinance is, is signed? I'll have, we signed I'll a resolution, but I think there was number. there was an ordinance for a second reading. Which one is So where are you talking more? I missed that. The where are you talking? Ooh.